let's talk about let's talk about Tariq's new retrospective. He's back hey. back in the retrospective game. I'm back in Would business. You, I never even watched the show The Weekenders, but watching your re- retrospective on it, I'm like, oh, this looks good. I should watch this. <laughs> I've never seen it. Fam, I love The Weekend. I, it started out because I just kind of uh, I had a different video that like I was like, yeah, I'm probably gonna do this. I was like talking to Delhi about it, and then one day I just kind of woke up. And I said, I want to watch The Weekenders. So I, I asked for it. Like, I, I asked uh, for, like, if anybody had the files. And then I just kept going. And I started taking notes. I was like, oh, I'm doing this. And so I kept <laughs> going, started taking That's notes. That's the best and then, way to start a video. Yeah, when you just kind of fall into it. Yeah. It's kind of just fell into it. And then, um, yeah, I think it's, I'm like, I'm like one of the, like, annoyingly modest people but i think it's like the best video i've ever done like i'm very proud of it (laughs) i think it's easily your funniest video i was laughing the whole time (laughs) it's great (laughs) it's great yeah it's really good if y'all haven't checked out his weekenders retrospective go check that out um what else what else we got to talk about we got um, oh uh while we talking videos you hit trending Oh, yeah, me? I did. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot actually about the show we're going to talk about today, and right. stupidly once again <laughs> forgot to plug the podcast in there. I am the worst. I am the literal worst. To be fair, though, <laughs> I re- I recorded that video on on close to no sleep while I was out of town in a closet in an Airbnb. I didn't know all of that. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's it's a mer- it's a miracle that I even got it done. And, uh, and then, it, yeah, it's crazy. It's easily the fastest viewed video I've ever had. And it also hit the trending YouTube page, which is hit a thing trending. that has never happened. I don't think hit it'll ever million. happen to me again. Hit a million in a week. In one week, mm-hmm. it hit a million, which is crazy. Uh, what else do we talk about? We should talk about the Bob's Burgers movie. Did we Bob's talk about Burgers that on movie. here yet? No, we, uh, maybe. I don't know. I, all I know is ever since they announced it, uh, like a year ago, I haven't been able to shut up about it just because <laughs> I I am obsessed with the fact that it's going to theaters and I really want to know how it looks. That's that the other. Oh, you about. know, you know what? That's what happened is last time we did an episode, we talked about m- animated TV movies, like movies based on an- on TV shows going to theaters and how that's not a thing. And then like two mm-hmm. days later, they announced the Bob's Burgers movie is officially for sure going to theaters. So that was oh, nice you know, timing. You know, what's another one? Uh because we were talking about TV shows in general is like uh, making movies coming out in theaters. There's a Sopranos movie coming out. Like that's October right. 1st. I forgot. And that's going to theaters. Yeah. In theaters. I thought that was a show. No, it's a, it's a prequel film. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, they shot so that. that is how, yeah. They shot that here. Cause it's yeah. Cause it a, takes place there, right? It's called the, yeah. Sa- is it called the saints of Newark? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wild. Are you in yeah. that? Do you, do you get get a cameo? Uh, I ain't saying yes and I ain't saying no. What what Andrew Garfield <laughs> say? They, I haven't gotten a call. <laughs> <laughs> there might be photos of me on set, but there's I never got a call. Never got never a call got a about call. it. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest game of semantics. They probably just emailed them like, "Hey, come in today." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they, they text. They texted him about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've not gotten a call though. Uh, that's funny, um, but yeah, I'm stoked. Bob's Burgers in theaters, Many yeah. Saints of Newark in theaters. Get more, <laughs> get more stuff based on TV shows in the movie theater. I love it. it. I wonder, man. I wonder what's gonna happen if this Bob's Burgers movie does really well. Like, I wonder if man. anything's gonna be different. Like, I wonder if people let's, are gonna go, uh, "Oh, let's do that then." <laughs> It's also a musical, which is right. Like that's what the South Park did. It's like I, I, and also Bob's Burgers has so much music in it. It's kind of like yes. I feel like it's not talked about enough for how much music is in Bob's Burgers. No, uh, it's not the. It's not necessarily the thing people go to and notice. Yeah, and then also, obviously, Lauren Bouchard went on to make Central Park for Apple TV Plus, which yes. is fully a musical which i haven't watched yet but i've heard is very very good and i'm gonna start it's, watching. i've seen a i've seen a few episodes and it's really right gotta check that out i like that like an- animation is actually obviously with like the history of disney and stuff animation is like great for musicals so it's kind of interesting that we don't get 
that in television much. I guess it's more of a theatrical thing that they do animated musical stuff. Right. Because I think uh, it, it started It started out as two things. Like when, other sh- when shows started going to theaters, it started out as either we have to do the musical thing because Disney did it. So that's like the Rugrats movies. Where like are those Rugrats, musicals? Yeah, and they aren't inher- inherently musical shows, but like the first movie has a lot of songs, the second one does, and the third one I has only less songs. F- but man, I think I only saw the first one in theaters. Um, the and first one's my favorite one. I don't remember there being music in it, but I do remember a lot about it. Reptar, what is it called? The Reptar truck or whatever. The Reptar wagon. Uh, Bust the Reptar Roms. Reptar wagon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then that introduced Dill, right? That was the whole Dill yes. introduction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that was a big deal. Harry, can I ask you, uh, does, uh, because you just watched it, does Doug's first movie have any songs in it? (laughs) No, I don't think, (laughs) no, I don't think so, actually, that's true, it doesn't. So yeah, that's that's a good point, Doug's first movie is one of the only ones that just kind of went like, uh, nah, never mind. And, ironically, (laughs) it's a Disney, it was like they gave him a movie when he went to Disney, and they didn't do music. (laughs) But I think that might be why they didn't do music, because, like, Disney knew that they didn't have to, but like something like Rugrats was kind of like, well, Disney's doing this and they're doing really well. So let's just do that. So it started out as either that, or sometimes it would just be like, uh, like South park. I mean, yeah, those are are the musical guys, but at the end of the day, a a lot of it is kind of parody a little bit. Yeah. So it's kind of like, well, we're going to theaters, we're doing an animated movie. Let's just put, make it a musical. Yeah. And they'd already done uh, a lot of music in the show too. So like, yeah. And their there first movie me, um, was Cannibal the Musical, the one they made in college. So, like, they're, they like musicals. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. About, yeah. they, they do a joke in the, uh, the first Billy and Mandy movie uh, where, like, they just start singing out of nowhere. And it's a really great scene, though, but they just start singing out of nowhere. And, like, they're talking to Billy, and they're like, well, why are you, what is this even about? Like, why are you singing? And he says, well, there's always songs in animated movies, so we have to. Like... That's just kind of something, right. I guess that's just something that everybody kind of thinks that they have to do. And then, like, uh, by the 2000s, uh, that just kind of, everybody just kind of stopped that. So then you get, like, the Recess movie, the Arnold movie, SpongeBob right. movie. Like, yeah, after a while, it was just like, ah, oh, let's just put them on the big screen. Who cares? Yeah. And then even now it's like Disney is Disney's obviously in the last like 10 years had a bit of a resurgence, but they it seems like they alternate. Mm-hmm. They'll do it. They'll do a musical and then they'll do a non-musical. You'll get you'll you'll get your Tangled and then you'll get your Wreck-It Ralph and you'll get your Moana and then you'll get your uh, what else do they do? That's not musical. Big Hero 6. Big Hero 6. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Utopia. Yeah. Which is cool. Which yeah, which Zootopia. one? Oh, Zootopia. Zootopia. Right. Zootopia. Yeah. Zootopia. Zootopia, That's right. Zootopia that, and Moana. Like, uh, that like Shrek inspired like ends with a dance party thing that like every animated true movie suddenly the Sh- Shakira, oh, it right? does. which was like by then that was dated like this was like 2016 2017 like nobody was doing that yeah. at that point but they did it yeah it was pretty I dated know. the song kind of slapped though so. yeah it's, it's, it was I think it was written by Sia actually um, who despite her uh, problematic film is still a good songwriter uh, <laughs> but, I thought that uh, was uh, I thought that was Shakira she performs it. Uh, I'm oh. pretty sure it was. Yeah. Um, mm. I'm pretty sure it was written by Sia, performed by Shakira. Got it. Uh, let me see. Maybe I'm super. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Let's see. Song recorded, written by Sia and some other people I've never heard of. Um, but that's Zootopia is an interesting example. That's kind of the perfect example because that same year it was Zootopia and Moana in the same year. So they had their non-musical and they had their musical come out. Oh, that it was year. the same year, wasn't it? Man, when they yeah. when they do that same year shit, it always kind of weirds me out. Uh, uh, finding Dory and Inside Out, weren't that, isn't that the same year? That might be. I know Good no, Dinosaur. It was, no, uh, Good it was Dinosaur Inside Out and, Inside and Good out. Dinosaur. That's what it yes, was. Right. That's what it was. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Onward, Onward and Soul, right? That's right. Yeah. That was the same year, yeah. Man, did you see the, uh, the Pixar announcement in like, the Turning Red and the Lightyear movie are coming out like four months apart. That's yeah, so it's weird. Getting closer. <laughs> it's getting closer. It's getting closer. 
there is a very two- very slim chance that they will be in theaters at least a week at the same time <laughs> yeah they they probably will i am yeah. um, i think i think turning red looks cool i really i think i like I that too. premise it's like cute hulk cute hulk movie <laughs> 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 um i'm excited about that uh, and you know, I'm very intrigued by Lightyear. We'll see what what the heck that is. But I I'm am intrigued. Too. I am too. Uh, <laughs> I I know, do uh, like. I think I think part of me is like, do we really need more? Uh, even tangentially related to the Toy Story universe, but the other part of me is like, uh, Pixar space movie, <laughs> like Pixar space movie. You know, <laughs> so it, it looks we'll like see. it's just their way of trying to get in front of the. Uh, the Buzz Lightyear cartoon that came out like 20 years ago. Like, yeah, oh, the, let's uh, just do Buzz that. Lightyear us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm excited, excited to see how Lightyear is. And, uh, you know, maybe that film like this podcast can go to infinity and beyond. Cue theme song. <laughs> <That's> gross. <laughs> <laughs> Watching them for years, it's always been something that fit with all the animated characters that's doing their own bits. With a fry who's in the future and a family guy that sucks. It's a father from a hella burger family that is about to show and spies is the same guy, except he totally same f- and diverse. Let's watch cartoons that uh, uh, yeah, that's bananas. <laughs> as rough. <laughs> What the f*** is up, everybody? Welcome to Cartoons That Curse, the podcast about cartoons that say swear words. My name is John, a.k.a. Johnny Tuchellos. I'm here with my co-host, Tariq, a.k.a. Toonrific. Tariq, Tariq, how are you today? I am Toonrific. <laughs> Have yeah, you ever said go. that? Have you no, ever actually never, said that before? <laughs> I've, actually, I've actually always been directly against that kind of speech, but we're doing it today. <laughs> I'm going to start saying that whenever anyone asks me how I am. I'm like, I'm tunerific, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, me that's Johnny. gonna be that's hey. There's a there's some merch idea. I'm tunerific, but Ew. it's my, it's me saying it. It's me saying Ew. it. <laughs> Me and Johnny, oh, uh, me and Johnny have switched apparel. Johnny has a shirt that says Unity, which if you didn't <laughs> know true. is what we need. If you're watching, uh, <laughs> and I have uh, a shirt reminiscent of the uh, BoJack finale. Uh, if you're a cartoons that curse fan, you may have heard me tell the story about uh, where this shirt comes from. <laughs> <laughs> when trying to figure out what I was gonna wear, I found it and I said. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This is just further further cementing the fact that we need merch. So we'll we'll get that going. Absolutely. Um, Cuz then we'll have uniforms. That's right. We should get some jumpsuits. We should get matching jumpsuits. <laughs> <laughs> Wear them every time we record. <laughs> you can't even see the bottom half, but oh well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. When, and then we and they have they they're monogrammed so mine will just mine will mine will say two cellos you know, yours will say tunrific <laughs> it'll be perfect yeah, it's pretty good it'll be perfect <laughs> oh man um so we're here today to talk about Rick and Morty season five we're taking a little break from Archer because Rick and Morty season five ended recently uh, and we figured now's the best time to to talk about it it's fresh in our heads we both rewatched it for this uh, for this podcast and yeah. A whole 10 episodes of Rick and Morty season five. We both watched so, them as they aired. Yes. We did. We, we both watched, watched them, them as, as we, aired. as we, they aired and we, and then we rewatched them for this. Um, and you know, I like, I've covered Rick and Morty a bit on my channel this year. I decided I tried in season four to like do a video for every episode. I was like, oh, I'm going to review every single episode. And I just like made the show not fun for me anymore Mm -hmm. it was like oh i have to figure out what i'm talking about every time i watch this show so this season i was very specifically like i'm gonna make a video when i have something interesting to say and i only ended up making two over the season but they both did great and i'm adopting this this methodology now i'm 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 not forcing myself to talk about rick and morty if i don't want to except Absolutely. for this podcast just kidding i wanted to do it for this uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but season five so like rick and morty is now on a pretty efficient schedule which is great they yeah. used to take so long between seasons but since their 70 episode renewal after season three like it took a while for season four to come out but there was only about 
14 months between the end of season four and the beginning of season five, I think maybe even less. It might, it was, I don't remember actually. I think it was about, I think it was a little over a year between the end of season four and the beginning of season five, which is a totally reasonable schedule that I am cool with uh, Mm -hmm. instead of two years (laughs) for 10 episodes. Right. Yeah. Uh, And I think we can expect that to continue because, you know, they were before season five had even come out. I remember Justin Roiland tweeted that they had finished writing season six already. So they're like, they're ahead They're ahead of the game. Yeah. All right. so the show came back let's talk about it uh do you have any thoughts on season five as a whole before we dive into it or should we save it for the end uh yeah mm. man (laughs) okay i guess i guess i'll just be very transparent and say that uh this is this is my least favorite one uh so a lot I, of these I, I dragged through a lot of these <laughs> i thought it i thought it was my least favorite as well uh but the more that i kind of sat on it and let it marinate um i think the good mm-hmm. episodes in this season elevate it a bit above season four for me uh but okay. it isn't like but it's just because like i think it ends really strong i think the last three of the season are really uh, good yeah. And then I and then I and I love there's one that I really love in this season, which we'll talk about soon. Um, So, yeah, I don't know. I was like initially I was like, yeah, this is my least favorite season. But the more I thought about it, the more I was like, I guess there's more episodes I really like in this season than in season four. Uh, So even even if maybe season four dragged a little less, like it feels like maybe Mm -hmm. the highs are higher in this season. So, uh, yeah, it's you know, there's a lot to say about this season. And I think i i think i still like it <laughs> i'm just like it's just i don't know we're like 50 episodes into the show and i'm like oh man we got 50 more of these don't we we got right, at yeah, least yeah. 50 more coming this is halfway know, through um, the show uh that's the thing about it though is that like the uh the the ratio to episodes that i enjoy in comparison to the ratio of ones that i don't is like so low that I don't know if I would say that I like the season, but mm-hmm. like at the same time, I wouldn't say that it's like bad TV or anything like that. You know right. what I mean? It was just kind of like, uh, some of these are kind of boring. Like some of these are just kind of like, I don't really, I don't really yeah. care that much right here. Like, you know what I mean? It was just kind of, I don't know. Yeah, I feel that. And I think a lot of it also just comes down to personal taste and preference because like even Absolutely. the episodes that I don't love, I like there's so many of them where like conceptually I respect them. <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? And that's that's yeah. the thing is that there's a is it I don't know if there's an episode this season that I don't respect conceptually. You know what I mean? Like Right. I think even the ones where like I'm like, man, this is really boring. I think are like great in concept. There's one in particular that like even I think it's the lowest one on my list, honestly. Let me check. Uh, okay, it's not, but it's like one of the lowest ones on my list, and I think it's a good concept. It's just the way that they did it was kind of uh, and exhausting at first, and then I started to get bored. Like we'll get to that one, but it was just kind of yeah. I found myself I, doing that a lot with these. I I'm wondering if we feel the same way about this specific episode because that's like almost perfectly describes one of the episodes on this list for me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> which, which it was like the whole time I was like, this episode's so smart why why aren't i having fun <laughs> like, yeah, this, is, this, this idea bad. is so funny <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah um all right well let's start with the first one then 501 right. uh and also forgive us if we flub these titles because they're just getting more and more ridiculous which part of me is like that's annoying and the other part of me is like oh no keep keep leaning into it make them even more convoluted uh, I, I like them so, when I don't have to say them out loud. Like, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so this first one is Mort Dinner Rick Andre, <laughs> which mm. is a My Dinner with Andre title parody. Um, and this episode basically has two things going on. Morty is trying to have a, a date at home with Jessica while... <laughs> while Rick is having a dinner with his with his nemesis, a guy named Mr. Nimbus, who is introduced in this episode. All right. Um, so it starts off. Actually, the int- the beginning is really interesting because it 
uh, is kind of a subversion of the usual thing because Rick is like dying. <laughs> Rick yeah, is yeah, like yeah, about yeah. to die and Morty's saving him, which I think is a, which I like as the, the growth of Morty continues. We see how he becomes more and more or less and less of just like the sidekick and more of a like almost partner obviously rick kind of looks down on him but like he's way more capable now like he he fully saves them in the in the cold open of this episode and uh, uh and while after doing the rewatch i think contextually for this season i think that's a good way to start too like just yes. knowing where they go later i was like oh okay they did start like this that makes a lot of sense agreed agreed um so like he's saving Rick. He actually gives up for a minute and then he calls Jessica to say say goodbye to her and and basically she's like do you want to like do you want to go out? <laughs> you want to have a date? And that <laughs> and that gives him that gives him the motivation to actually save them. Um, right. landing them in the ocean which then uh, introduces us to Mr. Nimbus, which I I was trying to think if there was ever a time where they touched the ocean. <laughs> in another episode <laughs> i can't but i can't think of any i can't think of any where they touch the ocean so maybe that that works canonically is uh rick rick's nemesis is this like weird horny aquaman character named mr right, yeah. um who i know some people didn't like him i think he's i think he's funny <laughs> i think he's i think he's got some funny stuff going for him uh he's a he is a little ridiculous but um mm. i love when he comes to dinner and Jerry is like calls the police on him <laughs> and right. uh, and all the police show up and they're just like, you can't do that, Jerry. He controls the police. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And he and, and they, he literally makes the police do. He makes he says, fight, fuck, <laughs> flee. flee. <laughs> the police yeah. just start fucking each other. <laughs> I remember when this aired uh, and he did that bit. I remember thinking like. That's supposed to be really funny, but it didn't make me laugh. And I remember I said that, and you said, you, I think the text says, boo, that joke was funny. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was one of the things that made me laugh the most in the episode that first time we watched it, for sure. Um, this, I think, overall is an episode that, like, is another one that I, like, I, I really dig conceptually, but I didn't, mm -hmm. like, find myself laughing at a lot because I... I I really like the idea of this Narnia, this door to this Narnia world where time moves differently. And like, right. it's fun. It's funny to have Rick use something that complicated as just a means to age wine. Like that's so it's very mm -hmm. Rick. Um, it is like crazy brutal. And it's, and it's an episode that I think about when I, I made a video earlier this year before season five came out about like evil Morty and which will who we'll talk about later in this um but about evil morty and his potential motivations and whether or not he, I, I titled the video as evil morty actually evil but the point was more wasn't to like wasn't necessarily to like litigate his deeds it was more to be like is he evil compared to all of the stuff that our characters have done in this right. show like our rick and morty have done a lot of messed up shit and right, is absolutely. what is what evil morty has done worse than what morty or rick have done um and i think this is a strong episode that shows that like mm, they're comparable morty uh kind of genocides a bunch of people in this in this like multiple generations over a bunch yeah, of time yeah, yeah, yeah. um and I like, I really, I think the idea is really interesting conceptually and especially like, it's interesting to see Morty just get to his wits end and he's just like, I just want to be able to do my, my normal teenage things and all of my sci-fi bullshit is getting in the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, and so he just goes full Terminator mode, um, which is kind of reminiscent of the season four premiere where he, with the crystal, where he just like starts murdering people so that oh, he can die with Jessica like or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but it is like it is interesting because I think these episodes like are important to look at in the context of the show in in regards to, you know, what's what is evil in the Rick and Morty world? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, although there's always there's always the argument you can make is are these the same Ricks and Mortys that we see every episode right like do we yeah, ever sure. know 
Man, that um, makes everything really confusing. <laughs> it does. Well, and then we'll get into the next episode, which makes that even more confusing. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but how do you have any other thoughts on on Mort Dinner Rick Andre? What did you think about the Narnia stuff, uh, like that world or that plot? Yo, so when I watched this the first time, I hated that stuff. Like I was really, cause, yeah. Like I just kind of because I don't. Rick and Morty is like a hard show at least for me to uh settle my feet into a lot of the time meaning that like they this is the season opener and they didn't like ease into anything they just kind of started turning up immediately and i wasn't fully prepared at first so when it's just like all this stuff kept happening i'm like wait slow down (laughs) like hold on like i remember feeling like that when it's premiered so the second time watching this, uh, I did grow an appreciation for all of the, uh, you know, like the the portal stuff and Narnia stuff. Uh, I thought that stuff was really good conceptually. Um, it's much it was much easier to follow for me the second time around as well. But I'm not sure if it was like particularly fun in that regard. But right. Um, but still, like there's still stuff to uh enjoy i think nimbus especially like early in the episode is animated beautifully like the way (laughs) they they do like these really nuts poses with him and he's like he's like sticking his neck out and he's making all these faces and expressions it looks really expressive and it all looks gorgeous um yeah that's, that's that was definitely uh a takeaway here. Oh, one thing that I noted too that I wanted to ask. So, uh, is Nimbus the first person to say Beth's mother's name? He might have been. I. It was funny because they did start name dropping Diane this season, yes. and I feel like I didn't really remember them ever saying her name before this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he might be. I. I can't confirm that for sure, but it's it's like the first time that I consciously like really remembered. Yeah, like remember that happening. So likewise. it was like, it's like um, an Archer thing. Remember, like last time we recorded, I was talking about how like that was the first time I realized they were in New York because they just kept saying New York. Right. Like, I feel like it might be that too. I don't know. That's right. That's right. You did say that last week. Yeah, but I I don't remember the name being dropped, and if it did, it must have been casually in a similar manner to this mm-hmm. because I it, I don't think there was any atten- real attention drawn to it. Um. Which makes me think that if they're starting to name drop her more and now obviously at the end of the season, we'll talk about this later, but they do a lot more confirmation of Rick's like true backstory. Uh, I, I expect something with Diane to come up over the next five seasons, you know, like it feels like they've got to explore that because that is like that is one of the major aspects of the show's backstory that is like almost completely untouched. So it feels like they've they've got to get there at some point. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing, right? Is that I mean, like, granted, we'll we'll get there later uh, in the season, but like, they explain what happened to like his original Diane and Beth, but I we never hear what actually happens to Diane in the timeline where Beth still exists, right? Like, that's right, exactly, and that yeah. that confuses me too, because like that's. That's the interesting thing. Obviously, we'll get into this later. So we're, we're kind of getting into episode 10 of the season territory. But with the confirmation that uh, that our Rick l- lost Diane and Beth when when Beth was very young, they both died. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't. But 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 our Rick continues to like go live with abandoned Beth's quote unquote. So like we've obviously saw him at the beginning of the season was with one, one family. And then he and Morty jump over to another one in episode six. Uh, But what is, what's the deal with the family in that, in those timelines is Diane dead or is she around? Uh, It doesn't feel like she would be around. It feels like, it feels like there's something must've happened to her. Um, So I, yeah, that's, I think that's, I think that's uh, something they have to explore at some point. Uh, mm-hmm. especially and honestly you know what's gonna you know what would be a really smart way to tie that serialized story into another one would be to make that 
uh, somehow related to Space Beth. Like Space Beth is like such a go getter badass mm. now. If there's somewhere out there where we're going to learn what happened to Diane or she needs to learn what happened to Diane or discover an alternate Diane, it feels like exploring that through this clone Space Beth would be a smart move. Uh, yeah, especially okay. because it it feels like they try to tie all the serialized stuff in concisely versus over the course of the show. They're like, ah, oh, here's eight episodic episodes and then a couple that are serialized. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it feels like they try to they try to kind of merge all that stuff together, which um, and honestly, this season sets up a lot of stuff that feels like it can and should be followed up in a serialized manner eventually even though we know that the show doesn't do that that often. So I'm eager to see what they do over the next 50 episodes. That's yeah. a lot of episodes. <laughs> um, including the end of this episode. Let's talk about that. The Jessica thing where Jessica just becomes like fully enlightened to seeing the breadth of yeah. the entire universe. <laughs> um, that is, I think a cool fun ending for this, but also like that has to come back at some point that, and, and also right. Jessica never shows up again in this whole season. All, if I'm not for the mistaken. Rest of the season. Yeah. So I don't even, I, they barely go back to school. They go back to school for one gag. Like, right. In this whole season. And that's it. Yeah. And Morty even like complains about how he hasn't been to school in weeks or whatever. <laughs> <It's very funny. laughs> um, yeah, so I'm like, I, that's that's a thread that I'm like, oh, I want to see this come back somehow. Like, I really want, I really want mm -hmm. enlightened, like third eye opened Jessica to play a role somewhere down the line. Uh, and but like, when I was working at Nerdist, um, yeah. Justin and Dan came in and did an interview at, at Nerdist, and they taught. It was before season three. And they specifically were talking about the serialized story elements and they were asking them about it. And they kind of went on record as saying, oh, we don't ever we don't ever put these threads in there with the exact outcome pre-prepared. We, we what they like to do is they plant seeds. They plant little seeds of possibilities for them to potentially harvest later in the show down the line. You know what I mean? Which I think is a fine way to tell your story because sometimes something too rigidly planned gives you less freedom in what you want to do down the line. Uh, yeah. uh, there's uh, there's a lot of ways to write stuff, and obviously you don't. You know you you can pre-plan everything, but. Uh, to me, this is just an example of that. Like, this is a seed. This is a seed they're planting, mm -hmm. and they're just like, we're going to figure out how to grow the Jessica Third Eye seed <laughs> later in the show. All right. It is, it is kind of a uh, a slippery slope with that approach to it, uh, just because I'm kind of dipping into territory that, like, my knowledge is a little faint of. So, audience, please forgive me. But to But from what I remember... Uh, a big problem that a lot of people had with Adventure Time mid run was that it felt like they were just making stuff up as they went along. Sure. Um, and I think I think sometimes when the audience can see that, uh, it can kind of be a little uh, it could kind it could kind of be um, a little daunting because I don't even think anybody over at Adventure Time, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody over there even said what they said, just kind of like, oh, no, we don't have the whole thing planned out. We just kind of plan see, you know what I mean? Like, but again, mm -hmm. yeah, too much meticulous planning. Like, nah, they have to, they have to say this and they got to hit this beat at this episode at this point in time. Like that, that not only does that, um, you ever had like food that was overcooked? Like it kind of has that, feeling yeah. too. like it kind of does that you know what i mean yes um, and you know what like I, i'll i this is just something that's been in my brain a lot this week uh as mikey knows because i've been texting him nonstop about it uh because of the new matrix trailer i just rewatched the matrix trilogy um which i am more of a fan of than ever truthfully i've always been a huge fan of the first movie i was always kind of lukewarm on the sequels and i'm still not fully fully embracing the sequels but i do like especially the second one a lot more than i uh, had before but that's an example of something where they made the first one and then they were like all right 
we're going to make the whole thing in this two movie, like we're going to make them both at once. And we're going to, we're going to plan out the trilogy and make it like, make it happen. You know what I mean? They're just Mm -hmm. like, this is it. And it feels, it, it feels like that. It feels overcooked. Like I, there's a ton Mm -hmm. I love about those movies, but as a complete package, it's like, Oh, this is a little overcooked. (laughs) Like they're, they're really, really getting into this deep. Yeah. Um, I feel you. Even though I'm really, psyched um, for the next one. I don't know what the... Uh, I don't know how you split the diff on that kind of stuff, man. Because, like, I think about that. And I think about how, like, with certain things, I just kind of love that shit. Like, I love... Uh, but, again, I don't know. I think it just might be... Um, it might be just planting seeds and then figuring out what you want to do later on. But, like, even, like, in film, right? Like, uh, I don't know, Baby Driver. Like, it almost seems like every single line they say comes back somehow in the end. Yeah. And it takes a lot of meticulous planning. (laughs) I was just going to say that exact word. I was going to say that is a meticulously planned movie. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) like it takes a lot of that to to put that together, but it doesn't feel um, feel overcooked. I think about... And then I think about like regular show, right? Where there is no way in hell that they had the ending to regular show planned from the moment they started the show. Right. But I think regular show ends with the greatest final piece of dialogue I've ever heard in my life, which is uh, when um, it ends. Oh, spoiler, I guess, if you care, if you haven't seen regular show yeah. ended like a decade ago, but whatever. Uh I'm exaggerating, but <laughs> when um, you know after uh after they do like the flash forward and they pan out and shows that pops was watching it on the TV, and like the tape comes out and he says jolly good show, and I was like oh shit how did they do that like, <laughs> I was like it like blew my mind like but again oh, good. that just kind of seems like somebody was in the room and said. I think this is probably the best way to end this. It wasn't like JG Quintel just had it in his notes and like, yeah, then he just fucking pops the tape out and he said, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it, I don't think it was that. Um, to me, that is the best. The best to me, the best way is to have ideas of what you want to do, but not to be too rigid with them as the show evolves. Because uh-huh. because part of to me, part of making a TV show is not just having the idea and having these ideas planned out, but also seeing in execution how how it actually plays out how your perception of those things changes based on uh, you know how the characters how the actors deliver lines like you know like things change Mm -hmm. even perception wise over the course of making a show like a character can be intended to be one way but over the course of the performance from an actor can change the entire how the character is perceived or how the character even is ends up being written um so like to have a beginning and end written ahead of time to me, you know, depend, it depends on what the thing is, but I think in a show Mm -hmm. to some things it can be detrimental. And I kind of like when a show is able to evolve and grow with its viewers based on, you know, how it's perceived and how you make it and how your mind changes when it's being made. Um, You know, I think, and also because of the nature of television, you have to be a little flexible because you don't always know how you don't always know how Absolutely. long it's going to go. So um, you know, uh, obviously they have a they have a they're pretty lucky here at Rick and Morty because they know they have at least 50 more episodes. So maybe they're just going right, so to write that hundred episode on. mark and say, that's it. Um, so who knows? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. You know, uh, you know what that's like? I just thought about it. And it's a show that I didn't even watch that much. But I just know that this was an issue afterwards. I think. I think partially I learned this from uh, from talking to my friend uh, Nerdstalgic, uh, but uh, how I met your mother, mm. like they like had that because the whole thing I guess is just to tell like just like the telling of a story or whatever. So they had the kind of the ending planned and essentially filmed. You know what I mean? Like not. Not not the entire finale, but I think maybe like the flash, uh, the flash forward scenes. I'm not really too sure, but that, but I just remember people feeling as though the way that it ended didn't really uh, stay true to uh, who the characters um, 
ended up becoming. Um, which like, yeah, because they, they kind of went in saying like, all right, we telling this story and we trying to get to this specific spot, not realizing that the writers may favor certain characters or favor certain right. relationships. Like that might just end up happening. You have a room full of people because it's all collaborative. You come in with your pitch Bible. Yeah, sure. But like, you don't write the whole thing by yourself and you don't, you don't act the whole thing out by yourself. You know what I mean? Like it is really collaborative and things evolve. You're absolutely right. For sure. Yeah. And that's like, and that's the balance you have to, you have to figure out is, you know, Mm -hmm. obviously if you're making a mini series or if you're like, Oh, I have a show and it's got three seasons and it's already written, that's one thing. But you know, if you're doing an ongoing show, things, things can change over the course of making that show. So it's a thing. It's a whole thing. Um, but let's move on. Let's move on to the next one. The because uh, we talked about one episode and that was a good little good little television tangent there. Yeah. Uh, so five five oh two is Morty Plicity. Is this the one that you th- you th- liked conceptually but found exhausting? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I I actually I wrote that down as well, even though I was thinking about an additional one that made me feel that way. There's two this season that made me feel that way in particular. Um, okay. But this one is such a cool idea such a cool concept but truly is like wow this is a lot and it's exhausting <laughs> and yes um this is Especially the episode that that first act, man right yeah. um this for those who don't know or can't remember don't remember this is the episode that reveals that rick has created uh decoy families which are basically uh android versions of their family to protect them in case uh, something ever comes after Rick and his family. They come after the decoy family instead, kill them. And then the real family is safe. Uh, But as you slowly learn, (laughs) the decoy families started to make their own decoy families. And all of a sudden there are just endless decoy families of the Smith family all over. So uh, the one thing, even though I like this concept on the, on the level of the decoy families, yeah. I don't understand how this works logistically. Where do all of the decoy families live? Where where are all of these alternate exact Smith households? I and thought if I they're, was tripping. <laughs> if they're not yeah, in the same town that they live in, then where yeah, like is that just something he reprograms? I guess they don't address it, but like like Do he does he just build a decoy town? Like Right. Who? Right, exactly. All right. All right. I thought I was tripping. All right. And I do so think much. that like I also don't I don't know how you address that when you make this episode either. Like I can't you know what I mean? Right, yeah. I feel like maybe maybe the episode idea is just worth going diving deep into and not worrying about that side of things because that's like a long walk to take. <laughs> but uh but it is like it the whole time I was just like, "Wait, what?" Like, so there's thousands of decoy families. Where do they live? Where are they? What do they all have? Do they all go to the same school? Like, yeah. Did he create the same school? Do like, like does Morty have like, are there decoy Jessica's and teachers and like all this other stuff? Yeah. Like, it's just a lot. I just don't know how that works. Um, But it's still like, again, a very cool sci-fi concept. And it, it is like, as crazy as the first act is, it is always kind of like, oh, they're, I don't know, every time a decoy family, every time you learn that the family you're following is another decoy family, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> again, yeah, again, yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. And it becomes the like, the game. It's the game of the episode for a minute there. But uh, it is like after a minute or two, you're kind of just like, okay, how many more? <laughs> How many more DK, DK, DK families are going to get killed? It just, it just goes until literally the end. Un- literally yeah. until the episode cuts off. It just keeps going. And again, yeah, I think the concept, I think it's a, a fun concept. I think it's a good concept. Uh, but it, it, it was kind of like, they kind of, they, they throw you in there, which I feel like, I feel like if you're going to do it, you should, you should throw the audience into it. Uh, yes, but still, I, it, I, agree. I don't want to, man, I don't, that's the thing about this one though, is that I don't know what the hell I would do differently. Like, right, right. I exactly. don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I would do different. Uh, 
Yeah, I feel like sometimes these crazy ideas are just still worth doing. Like, I feel like this is kind of how I felt about this, the heist episode last year, um, Mm -hmm. which like that is another exhausting episode because it is so thoroughly dismantling the heist tropes and just being like, it's heist on heist on heist on heist, like twist on twist on twist on twist. And and part of me is like, oh, this is so tiring to watch. And the other part of me is like, yeah, but if it wasn't, like if it wasn't that, what is this? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what? What even is this even an episode if you're not do, if you're not willing to take that that risk? So like even That's if it's true. something I don't love watching, I'm not like thrilled to watch. Uh, it is pretty cool and interesting, and maybe worth a worthy uh, a worthy risk to take when you're making a show like this. No, yeah, I, I agree. They kind of. Uh, they kind of thrive on these just kind of like escalating dilemma uh, as episodes where like things just get like more and more uh, insane. That heist one has that wild ass bit where they just argue back and forth. Like I programmed you to think that. Well, I programmed you to think that. Like, you know what yes. I mean? Like yes. <laughs> it just keeps going. Which uh, I don't remember why I landed on that bit back then, but I think it's funny. <laughs> It is funny. My favorite part of the episode is still the end when Morty goes to pitch his Netflix show or whatever. And he's oh, just it like, does end like that. And, yeah, and the, yeah, the, uh, and the just guy's funny. just like, pretty crazy day, huh? The sky turned into a wall. <laughs> and Morty's just like, yeah, that was actually uh, an adventure I was having earlier. <laughs> Which is, I think that's a really funny really funny Wait, way but, to end the episode but then he like then he like attributed to like the traffic or something like it was something like really mundane yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he's morty's like it took me a while to get here because i was coming from the hologram wall that appeared in the sky and the guy's like yeah try coming down from malibu <laughs> yeah, <he's> just- <laughs> i think i think we talked about that last time but it's a uh, funny enough joke to to mention again <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty funny um but yeah, like so again, I I feel the similarly. Like this is a cool episode. I think it's a worthwhile episode. I'm glad it exists. It's not one I love watching. <laughs> it's kind of right. my take. Yeah, on likewise. It. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's some uh, there's some great design work in this one. Um, the uh, I noted the wooden decoys first. I think that, like I like I like how they look first of all, but. I love their sound design. Like I love like the voice box, like tone that they put on their voice when they speak. Um, yes, I agree. I think that I think that sounds really rad, and I, I fucking love the Muppet designs. The Muppet designs, Dude, the Muppet ones are great. so good. <laughs> the, so uh, good. The gross like scarecrow Rick is frightening like that is a frightening oh, yeah, design. yeah it is, yeah it's a pretty terrifying um, yeah they did they that's and that's i guess the other thing is the episode is like i love the concept with all of the decoys the third act when they go through all these other like weird little sub like families it gets a little tiring like that part isn't as it's not as exhausting but it's not as it's i found it a little uninteresting um but Mm. they're like you said designs the designs are great although god i don't i i i I got i have a problem with the skinless character thing (laughs) like oh yeah okay yeah it reminds me of when they cut sideshow bob's face off and ever since they've like i (laughs) I hate it man it makes me feel so gross whenever they have his Mm -hmm. like skin flap fall off i'm like i don't i don't need to see that i get it i I get it it's yeah i get it but i don't need it um that That was just one of those that like oh man we're talking about the simpsons but that was one of those (laughs) i just that was they do a couple things every once in a while in the simpsons where i just kind of go you're literally breaking the world. Like that is not Simpsons. And that Sideshow right. Bob thing where he right. took his damn face off wasn't Simpsons. And it's it's just like a treehouse of horror thing. But they it happened for real. Exactly. <laughs> like, really? Exactly. Like and I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Yeah, I'm on the same page there. It I don't know. I mean, I also just have I just get weirded out. But I like I I, I feel like a physical grossness to that kind of like body. Bo- like that body horror type of style yeah. of stuff. Yeah. But I feel like the world that they set up just that just doesn't make any sense to happen. Yeah, I like, agree. Like 
Um, and that's saying a lot because it does get stretched. But again, yeah. I feel like it gets stretched for like joke purposes or whatever. Like, yeah, this was like and, a story thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, to this and to this to this episode's credit, it, it, that's a, something that is fully believable in the world of Rick and Morty for sure. Uh, absolutely, uh, yeah. absolutely. So <laughs> that's you know, it's you can't you can't harp on them for that exact same reason. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's gross. I don't like how it looks. It makes me feel bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I wasn't. I, I, I'm with you. It's not like I'm not like like I could I could still like tolerate it, but I'm not. I'm not a fan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like I'm like I don't know. Yeah, I could do without it for sure. All right, you got any other thoughts on yeah. Morty before we move on to three? I uh, know. Let's do it. All right, a Rick convenient Mort. Uh, I love this episode. This is the first one I made a video about this this season. Um, and I, I didn't expect this one to be the one that I loved going in. I was like, oh, they're doing a Captain Planet thing. Like, what the heck yeah, is this going to yeah, be? Yeah. Uh, but they take such an interesting angle with it. Uh, they didn't mm-hmm. just parody Captain Planet. They gave this idea that, like, it, it was it's a combined with, like, this intense, passionate infatuation, uh, like a like a like a, you know, a teenage love situation with Morty and Planetina. Um, and I thought they really, really effectively told this story. Like this is, Mm -hmm. this is to me the most emotional episode of the season. Uh, and one of the most emotional of the whole show, uh, is this one like really gets me good. Um, and it aired the same week as probably my favorite Tuca and Birdie episode. So it was back to back just just like. Uh, the nighttime friends episode. Oh but man, that it's episode was so such rad. a good, <laughs> such a good adult swim week. God, it was just the best back to back episode uh, yeah. watch that ever. Episode's it was good. so good. That episode, that episode's good. Okay. Um, yeah, that was man. I really hope Tuca and Birdie runs for a while because I I could definitely get used to like the back to back Tuca and Birdie Rick and Morty uh, <laughs> thing. That that's yeah. it's a it's a nice Sunday. Um, but so what I love about this episode is that like it's it really portrays this kind of like, it's a different, it doesn't portray, I wouldn't say it portrays love as much as it portrays like this, like, I don't know if you've ever, it's yeah, it's like an infatuation that feels like love. It's like this really intense burning, like, oh my God, I am so like infatuated and so like connected to this person. And you Mm -hmm. see Morty just like go through this whole process of like, of like growing to know someone and both of them like, you know, and also just like we've seen Morty so often like struggle and dating and to, to see it be reciprocated. So, so thoroughly, they both were just so into each other. Um, Mm -hmm. And you, you really feel the growth of it. And it's not like, I think one of the things I I got some comments on my video that were critical of it because it was not a well-developed relationship, but I think that's just completely missing the point of what this was. This wasn't supposed to be, a, de- a, re- a relationship in which they like truly grew to know and understand each other deeply, which is what the crux of the, the like climax is the, right. the problem. Right. That's why so, it falls like, apart. Exactly. Because they, because they fell so deeply, they were so deeply infatuated with each other. They were right. so, they were so into each other that they didn't, realize that they weren't necessarily on the same page on a like fundamental and spiritual level like they yeah. they and so they they over, like there was an oversight in that process because they didn't truly know each other that well yet and so once those things started started to reveal themselves like the end is so heartbreaking because morty doesn't want to break up with Planetina. He doesn't want them to, to break up. He is, he is still deeply, deeply infatuated with her. He, he cares about her deeply. He just feels that they fundamentally are mismatched. He feels like he has no choice mm-hmm. and he has to end things because he doesn't feel, he doesn't feel right on a fundamental level with what's happening in their relationship. And right. so like that last scene is so heartbreaking because like, yeah, Morty broke up with her, but you know, like, you know how much that pained him. You see how much it pained him. Um, Man, that last, and the last shot is just like, so there's so many good shots in the end, Mm -hmm. in that last scene, the shot, 
there's a shot where he's hanging out the window talking to Planetina and they're like kind of relitigating everything and talking through it. And she's just like she wants she wants to stay with him and he feels like he can't. But behind him, you see the wilting, flowery Morty head that she made for him. Right, yeah. uh, and it's just like perfectly behind him. And then when when she leaves and she says, fuck you, and you watch him looking out the window and you see her like supersonic away. Um, yeah. It's uh, and then and then the the shot the one of the shots that fucks me up is him laying in bed. It's like the angle, the, uh, yeah, the, the angle. yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good shot too. Which I want to even dialing it back a bit because you brought up when she says uh, when she says fuck you and like uh, goes off. That read is crazy. Like I didn't, you know, when the episode came out, it was censored. I just watched it uncensored for this. That read is crazy. Like it's so oh, heartbreaking. I didn't... I actually haven't watched watch it uncensored. No, because I watched that, it on Hulu Live, so it's still censored on there. Um, got it. So I got I got to check those out uncensored. Um, the way that yeah that that read is nuts. Like the way she the way she said that like it 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 contextualizes the episode different. Uh, watching it uncensored, I'll say that. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out ASAP. Uh, that's an Allison Brie performance as the guest star, who is excellent. Love Allison Brie. I've been mm. a big fan ever since Community, but obviously BoJack is one of my favorite shows ever, and she's excellent as Diane. Um, but uh, great performance as Planetina. She does such a good job, sort of like per, a per, in these in these moments where she is like heartbroken. Not only for Morty, but but there's scenes where she's heartbroken over what's happening to the planet as she is yeah, this yeah, like yeah. they they take so this like such a realistic approach to the pl- Captain Planet idea where she is literally like in pain because of the damage being done to the planet. And so her reactions are, you know, in conjunction with how how intense that feels to her and her mm-hmm. her delivery in the lines where she's just like can't you see there's no time the planet is dying she is such a good actress her, her delivery in those sequences are so well done yeah, yeah, yeah um man it's i i really like this episode i think it's i love really uh, good. the the read uh the read from morty when uh like right when he's like about to storm out the house and he tells Beth like I'll never forgive you and like everybody yes. like yeah and uh. he, like everybody like sighs when I speak because they feel like it's just a chore to hear like it was it's so good <laughs> like it's it so is good. Justin Roiland I think Justin Roiland we don't talk enough about how good of a voice actor he is uh, mm-hmm. playing playing both Rick and Morty obviously is like crazy and a lot so I have a fly flying around me um, but cr- playing both Rick and Morty is obviously a lot but like that is this in particular like just highlights how how good of a performance he can give as any as either of those characters and that is right, such yeah. a like emotion driven performance not only in that sequence but then obviously in the end when he's when he's crying to beth um mm-hmm. both such emotional scenes and such great deliveries um yeah i man love 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 this episode um there's so much to like about it and then yeah obviously like i and it's even fun in the ways that they like parody and dismantle the whole captain planet idea like like the idea that the captain planet kids are instead these like exploitative uh like managers who who are like well we got to figure out how we make money on you planetina like let's figure out all of your let's figure out all of your like your press briefings and all of your like you know and all of that stuff um, she's a brand more show than so than she is a person. Uh, and that's just already an interesting that's an interesting idea. It's cool. Um, I guess we should also talk about the the B plot of like Rick and Morty or Rick and right. Summer going on all of these like end of the world benders. They keep going to different worlds that are about to end entirely and just going on mm-hmm. like drug and sex fueled benders. Which um, I wrote that uh, I like that both plots are about love. They are. They are. Yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. they and they both kind of subvert uh, subvert a lot of the things about the show that we knew. Like this one is all about um, Morty truly finding something that he likes and then having to give it up himself. And and then Rick is a character who we wouldn't necessarily expect to just like fully embrace something like like he did in this episode and he does. And so um, I think it's interesting how they, how they decide to go that route. Uh, Mm -hmm. 
there is and then but obviously their their story is a little bit more played for humor gross out humor and stuff um, yeah, yeah, yeah. there is some, some funny that, uh, stuff there's that really great line where uh uh, the the people are pissed that the world isn't gonna end anymore. So she saved. She's the one who saved the world. Now we have to go to work tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And you get the <laughs> you get the guy the guy who <laughs> you get. There's the guy who had sex with his dad, <laughs> and he has to go back to work with him. <laughs> so the tag is just like, "Mom's not talking to us because we had sex." <laughs> it's like, I know people get real like people had problems with that, but is the the delivery and execution is very it's funny, very funny. <laughs> it's very funny <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things this season that people would just like had fundamental issues with and i was kind of like yeah but it's funny <laughs> it's funny though <laughs> um yeah do you have any other thoughts on a rick convenient more this is i i just love this episode it's one of my favorite episodes of the whole show it is one this one's this one's really good man it's really uh it's really good. it was the first one um because i'm not gonna lie when an, uh, it could be pretty apparent now since you just listened to us talk to talk about two episodes but when the season first started when i was watching it live um i just remember thinking like yeah i don't know if i i didn't i wasn't feeling the first two but this one i was like oh okay no they just they literally took all the elements of the show that i really really like and they threw them into one um and I think it's rad. Uh, I love this one a lot. Yeah, this it's really good. it's one of those endings that I just like. It's it's one of those endings in Rick and Morty that I love, where they they actually let it in, linger on the emotional or serious note. Uh, and and it's a thing we've talked about a lot in this podcast. And it's actually a thing I just talked about. I was I guessed guessed it on an LS Mark video about Rick and Morty, um, where we uh, we talked about I talked about how. Uh, I, I think the show can be so effective when it's willing to linger and sit on these emotional moments and not undercut it with a joke, um, which we even talked about last week in the Archer thing, because we were talking about how Archer will undercut everything with the joke, um, even though but but it works for Archer because that's what the show is established. That's just what the show mm-hmm. is. Uh, but Rick and Morty having established how effective uh, lingering on an emotional beat for the end can be or lingering yes. on any serious moment can be it, it can be frustrating when it feels like they have an opportunity to do that and choose to to joke about it um you know and gra- granted at the end of the day it's a comedy show and they should make the show how they want but <laughs> it is like it is a thing where i'm like oh, i like I, these moments work so well for me that i wish we had more of them <laughs> you know um, yeah photo so this is one of the best examples of it, I think. One of the best examples of a of an ending note, just like really punching you in the gut, um, which I'm sure you listening at home have noticed uh, is a recurring a recurring thing that Tariq and I enjoy <laughs> about yeah, about yeah, our yeah. cartoons. <laughs> uh, I want to cry. But speaking about uh, gross stuff that people have fundamental issues with, let's move on to the yeah. next episode. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, 504 is called Rick Dependence Spray, which uh, in context is gross. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the episode. <laughs> I don't yeah, really I'm, listen, man, I'm here. <laughs> I don't even really know how to describe this episode, but but basically it starts with Morty using at the horse hospital uh, yeah. a device a device to extract semen from horses. <laughs> and then and then Rick does I don't even I don't even know if I comprehend what was going on with the sci with in this sci-fi premise, but basically man. Rick's going to do something with that and because it's not horse semen, it's actually Morty semen. It creates all of these mm. giant sperms who start attacking the earth as like a monster movie type of thing, um, which just gets wildly out of hand by the end of the episode, obviously. It's uh, a nasty joint. It's a nasty, nasty episode. I don't think this episode deserved <laughs> the kind of like rejection that people gave it because <laughs> obviously the, the there is like the whole thing at the end of the episode. The yes, end of the episode yeah. it ends with them creating a giant incest baby, right? <laughs> a giant is, incest uh, baby in space. It's and the I, worst part of the episode. <laughs> people, people, people hate 
people hate, hate, hate that concept, but I'm like, it's not like they were advocating for it. The whole point of the episode is to prevent that accident. from happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're like, we don't accident. want this to happen. They are anti incest baby. <laughs> right. And and honestly, I think I think it's kind of funny. I don't know. I think it's funny. <laughs> I all right. So one thing I've I've learned, I've deducted from uh from doing this podcast is that there are there are two things that I like uh, that Rick and Morty does when it's really grounded and lingers on emotion and when it's fucking gross. <laughs> like the, I love this one and what's that other one that everybody hates? The the dragon one. I the dragon that. one. It's Dude, so there's funny gross. stuff in the dragon it's, one. It's I so literally nasty. one of my most one of my most quoted lines as delivery is just, yeah, so we can fuck woolly mammoths. <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny. I know people yeah. hate that episode, but that's funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, man. It's so... This episode right here, man, I remember when this came out. I, like... We... I just remember, like, I just... It's like, fam, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. It's so <laughs> gross. It's so nasty. Like, and everybody was like, ew, what are they doing? I'm not feeling this one. I'm like, what are you, it's so <laughs> sick. But again, that's probably just me. I wrote my first, <laughs> my first note for this episode. I got a lot of stupid notes for this episode. My first note for this episode says nasty joint with like 10 exclamation <laughs> points. <laughs> yeah. I like, and then, they, yeah. uh, they do, which is like, Ah, I can't remember the other show that does. Oh, Futurama. Okay, they do this in Spanish Fry, uh, where they just keep doing the, the dick talk. Yeah, like that's everything true. is just like is is just they just keep going, and they do it here. They uh, the president. The one I wrote down was the president saying, "Morty, you've always been a straight shooter. And you can't <laughs> prove that." And then I they kept piling them on to the point where my third note is so much dick talk with yep. more exclamation points. <laughs> They it, it is like this is a, a wild episode, but I do think people got so caught up in just like the fundamental issue with the incest baby that they like right, right, weren't right. willing to appreciate that. Like it's gross, but it's funny. Like, it's, it's a funny episode. Um, it's not I one of my favorites. It's, it's, it's not one of my favorites of the season, but it, it's like I don't think it deserved like. I don't think it deserved the kind of derision that no. people gave it immediately. My honestly, and it gave me one of my favorite deliveries of the whole season. It's one of the only things I wrote down for this episode. And it's the beginning. They do the cold open and establish that Morty's going to like use the machine <laughs> to jerk off basically. Oh, yeah, 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 and then yeah, yeah, yeah. they have him like sitting up on the roof and he just goes, Morty, you dirty little doggy. <laughs> it's, so, <laughs> it's so gross. It's so hey, gross. Uh, What's the man? Uh, I forget who the guy is that they go with. Uh, when but Rick and Morty go with this guy, and then the guy's dying, and he says, "I'll make love to my my wife one more time. Get the picture of her out." That's right. Uh, he said, and he says, "I know how to suck myself." <laughs> It's yeah, so gross. That, that bit was wild. Where he, so he's like, that's a that's a that's a that's a photocopied photo of Sports Illustrated model so and so or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like it's my wife. We have sex. <laughs> it's the first thing. He says. <laughs> It's so, it's so funny. funny. And then it turns out it was. In the end, it was. They reveal yeah, that it was. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, I heard you with my husband. Yeah. <laughs> and then. Cause I think he he has like a, a draws on or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he's got and he's, he's got like, a song on, and he says, "Yo, don't don't tell don't her, don't tell her." <laughs> yeah, and she is, and, and so she's she, like, "Was he wearing my thong? You can tell me, even if he told you what <laughs> I yeah. was." Always to be see. honest. She's giving him. She giving him mad, she, mad game. Always be <laughs> honest. Just like even if it hurts people, you have to always be honest. Right. Yeah. Nah. He had them on. I fucking sick, gross ass. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's a funny episode, man. I think it's funny. It's really, it's really funny. The one thing, uh, story wise, about this that I actively dislike because it's something that I just actively dislike in general, uh, in media, but in particularly animated media because they seem to do it a lot. Um, maybe because there's less women working in animation and ratio to the dudes but i really hate the let the men handle this narrative and then it, it always ends the exact same way 
do women always save everyone? And then they just kind of like, uh, like the dudes never really learn anything. Like, you know right. what I mean? It's just, I just think it's lame and I think it's tired. Yeah. Like, it feels like they've, it's like, it's not, it's not a clever subversion anymore. It's just like, mm-mm. well, do we, do we really need to frame it around this, <laughs> this same thing where it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, just, right. just give us a story where the women save everyone. We don't need to like frame it around the like, <laughs> you know, around the like, oh, let yeah, the yeah, men yeah, handle yeah, it. Yeah. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it just feels, it feels, it feels like that's a little old, it's a little old, old timey at this right. point. It's, it's been done. Yeah. Um, but, um, I can't, uh, I can't remember where this is in my ranking. All I know is, and even on my second rewatch, I didn't have as much fun as I had the first time. Cause the yeah. first time I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know why I get so excited when Rick and Morty does nasty shit, but I got so, <laughs> I got so hyped. I was like, oh, they're doing this? Ew, let's go. I don't care. <laughs> Whatever. And, yeah, man. People yeah, hate I it. I don't know. <laughs> and People hate it. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you one more. A uh, couple episodes later, the baby comes back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see that episode when it aired. Oh, so I had you no didn't. idea the baby came back. You know, and it comes back in no such a like, honestly, I, re- I rewatched that one today. And there was a whole section that I think I, I must have like fallen asleep during and never rewatched because there's like the whole section where summer we will get to it. But the whole section where summer is explaining how she, how she like was taken to Mars to meet the baby again. I forgot. I did, like didn't remember any of that shit. Um, and it was, it's pretty wild. And that's interesting. We'll talk about it when it comes up, but that's so interesting because the show is so non serialized for them to so directly bring back something that had just happened. It's almost like this is this, like a part two of right. the, the incest <laughs> baby episode. We know yeah. you were going to hate that. So they're back, um, which we will talk about soon. Uh, but you got any other thoughts on Rick Dependent Spray? Nah, uh, I think I said all my yeah, my about it. a little nasty, nasty, nasty joint. <laughs> Morty, you <laughs> dirty, you dirty little doggy. <laughs> nasty. All right, well Sick let's joint. let's move on to five oh five. This is a Mortykin graffiti. <laughs> um, so this, uh, I don't love this episode, but I, I, I like. I kind of like the Morty Summer premise uh, where they're basically Morty. And, the premise for Morty and Summer in this episode is that they uh, Morty invites the new kid, the new cool kid over from school. And they basically are like have major anxiety about like we have to impress the cool kid. We like we can be friends mm-hmm. with the cool kid. Um, and uh, and I like how they take that very down to earth and relatable idea like that's just a teenage that's just a teenage kid story idea and they then like amp it up with the with the car with the spaceship and the sci-fi stuff and you know like it's it starts off and just like we need to impress this cool kid from school and it ends with them going on this crazy you know trying to impress him on this crazy like uh, (laughs) this crazy space adventure um i honestly when i honestly kind of forgot about this episode though like i rewatched it today and i was like oh yeah <laughs> i forgot about so, this one until uh until this one i was under the impression that i just watched all of the episodes live you uh, forgot you missed a couple yeah because i didn't i was like that my first note is three question marks followed by did i skip this one because <laughs> i just i didn't know what this was um and then i realized that I'm remembering now that like uh if I would miss a Sunday, I would go and find a new Tuka, but not do the same with the mm, Rick uh, episode. Sure. I did that a lot. So you watched a lot um, of them live, but you missed but you missed if you missed the episode live, you didn't do uh you didn't do the re you you didn't necessarily download them and get them. Right. The only the only time I uh the only time I cared enough to uh, find a Rick and Morty after I missed it was uh I brought I remember I brought on my PS4 the uh, Bird Person one because I missed that that night. Mm-hmm. Uh, but good I one to catch. That one. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy I brought it. Yeah, uh, I wasn't. I didn't feel like I wasted my money or nothing like that. I went, that one's that was a pretty good one. Um, but yeah, nah, this one uh, this one was pretty 
boring, which is something that I, I'm probably going to say a lot uh, yeah. with, with a lot of these episodes. But yeah, this one, this one didn't, uh, didn't, this one, this one, this one didn't do it for me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have, uh, I have one note from a quote. I have two, I have two quotes. Uh, one quote is uh, when they get a, uh, when they're making fun of Jerry and uh, Beth says, yo, what's that Tina Turner song you like? And he says, what's love, Dr. Doolittle, Dr. Doolittle? <laughs> so I just think that's crazy. <laughs> that he thinks crazy. Tina Turner is singing about Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. Yeah, she's asking. Her song is asking Dr. Doolittle what love is. <laughs> what's, what's love, yeah. It's so sick. Uh, oh. And I like that they, at the end, I like the, um, the kid uh, says, Bizees. And Morty yeah. and Summer are like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, I will say, so like the first time I watched this, I feel like I was pretty bored. And I, I didn't love it the, sec- the second time watching it. It kind of feels mm-hmm. like, I don't know, like uh, part of me appreciates the whole like, oh, these hell demon people, they, <laughs> they get pleasure from things that are bad and painful, but therefore what is good is bad and what is bad is good. And is that like a never ending cycle? You know what I mean? Like if they feel good and that makes them feel bad, does that in turn make them feel good? Like, I don't know. I think that's like a weird, interesting thing to explore. Um, But it does feel like through the whole like Jerry cringe story, I'm just like, Oh, we, we know Jerry's cringe. Like we, this, we've done this. We've been doing this for years. Do we really need a whole, like a whole story set around that? I I think Mm -hmm. the one thing that I, I really like about this episode, even though this is is lower on my list. Um, The one thing I really like about this uh, is just the idea that Rick, A, it seems like Rick feels genuine, like Rick feels genuine shame. (laughs) He's doing this. He's doing this with Jerry to prevent these like hell spawn from, you know, being a bigger problem and murdering a bunch more people. Uh, But he feels genuine shame for what he's doing to Jerry. And to the point where he's literally willing to go to hell and back for, beth because beth is so like we need to go get jerry back so like i like the, i like the fact that rick is like all right we're gonna go to hell and back and we're gonna save your your husband and i you know i think that's good that's a good that's just a good storyline for rick give him a little bit more humanity he's not always super removed from like his family you know what i mean uh or mm-hmm. from humanity i guess and uh even though in the execution i don't super care for this episode <laughs> so that's where yeah, i'm at yeah, with yeah. this one Likewise. yeah um yeah i don't know i don't have much other th- I, there's there's the one i you know one one sequence i really like is when when the when the ship takes over the adventure and and takes a whole solar system and drags it behind the ship to to basically fish for galactus style like space titans like it's full on just galactus from from the marvel universe and they they catch it (laughs) baiting it with a whole solar system uh which i think is just like a crazy and wild sci-fi sequence and then they kill it and she's like oh it wasn't big enough um that was uh, there's some like cool sequences like that but uh that kind of uh that kind of reminds me of like that weird pseudoscience from Futurama where they say like the, the ship isn't flying. It's like yeah, it's moving, moving the universe. The universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, but I like, I also just like that. Like, even though Rick and Morty is a sci-fi show, it's not afraid to do science fantasy. Like, you know, it doesn't care mm-hmm. if it brings in and that's, you know, that's been established for pl- many seasons at this point, but you know, bringing Definitely. in, a giant planet eating Titan is, is not uh, out of the realm of possibility for the show, which is, I think a good thing. Mm-hmm. Glad they're not too stringent on the, uh, on the sci-fi stuff. Uh, you got any other thoughts on a Morty King graffiti? Nah, man, I'm bare, bare bones with this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on. Um, five Oh six is Rick and Morty's thanks. Exploitation spectacular. Uh, and I, this to me was another episode that on paper I think is very funny, but I found exhausting. Uh, I, I, it was just a lot, but the whole premise that Rick wants to turn into a Turkey to get pardoned by the president is a hilarious. That is a hilarious idea. I can never, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can never deny that that isn't 
so funny. And like the also, I also like the idea that Rick and the president are so intertwined with each other and they've continued this like dick measuring contest ever since season three, where they really established it, that they both are predicting each other's moves every step of the way to try and stay one step Mm. ahead of the other one. I think that's like good. I think that's good stuff. Like I really like that all on paper, Uh, but it was definitely an episode that I was just like, by the end, I was just like, what the hell did I just watch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I think the second time around, this one got a little easier for me. But yeah. it was, it is still, it is still like a damn fan. What are y'all doing? Like, yeah. Uh, but again, it's some, it's just there's some really funny concepts and just like funny stuff in general uh, with this. Uh, for well, it's not even the first thing on my list, but I do want to get it out the way that like when the president is like about to die and his like his life is flashing before his eyes and well, at least he hears it. And it just so happens to intercut the release of every PlayStation. Uh, <laughs> so that's until so the last funny. bit, he's like, I really want the PS5. <laughs> and then that's when they drag him out the water. That's so that's really funny. Oh, uh, man. Um, PS5, I think, still uh, very hard to get. Good luck getting a PS5. Get. I'm trying, I've been uh, trying to get an Xbox Series X and I've had... I've I've had it in my cart at th- th- on three different occasions, <laughs> and it sold out sold out while I was clicking checkout. And I was I I'm so mad that I can't get a damn Xbox. <laughs> I just want a damn. damn Xbox. That's what um, happened to me with those. Uh, remember but I am excited. There's a new game and, uh, came out just called Death Loop that I really want to uh, really want to play for PS5. Remember when uh, the uh, when we talked about the Simpson vans? We talked about like the Mr. Plows. Mr. Yeah, Plows, I really wanted Mans. the I really wanted the Mr. Plows. Yeah, not the day they came out, they were in my damn cart, and then uh, I tried to buy them, and then they disappeared. <laughs> so I couldn't get them. That's how I couldn't get them because they sold out while I was getting them. Yeah, man, it's annoying. It's hard to get limited edition shit. Oh, I was supposed to order the new iPhone today because I have an old iPhone. I wonder if Which I can do, you still have? do that. I have eight plus. Oh, gross. Yeah, I'm it's pretty sorry. old. I've been I waiting for the I've been, <laughs> been waiting for the new one. Uh, let's see if I can do it yet. Me, I think I me can. just saying "oh, gross" to you just now is like you ever see that? You see that clip of Kevin Hart and Don Cheadle, where he says, "Oh, I'm 58 years old," and Kevin Hart says, "Damn." Oh <laughs> 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 uh, man. So, yeah i I don't have all that many notes on Rick and Morty's thing exploitation spectacular because I just felt by the end I was just like I don't know if I understand everything I just watched. I love oh, yeah, the premise. Sure. I like the idea that Rick needs to turn into a turkey to Mm -hmm. get pardoned by the president, but it just went so, I don't know. I just like, I didn't, I didn't have a ton of fun watching it. It just felt like, like there was so much action and visual noise that I was like, what the fuck is this shit? What's going on? I got, so I, I I have a list of, cause there's a lot of things about this one that I really like. So I have a list of like all the stuff that I really like. Uh, Cool. Go, go down it. That'll be perfect. I really like the the scene with the uh with the soldier and his girl at the at the pool hall. Yeah, I do like uh, that too. <laughs> where she's like pregnant and he's like, Yo, I gotta I gotta go. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I gotta go. I like that. Uh I wrote the turkey fight is visual nonsense because it yeah. literally was. <laughs> That's how I felt. Yeah, agreed. It literally was. Um I think the president be being a turkey is a funny concept. Like not mm. Not not uh, the president becoming a turkey, but, but when the turkey they, turns into the president, <laughs> right? Yeah. I think that that's really funny. Um, I love the little. Uh, it was actually apparently I wrote this. Apparently, it was the first smile I cracked during this entire rewatch. The uh, the little uh, little racist bait and switch they do with the bartender, where he's like, I, I, uh, he says something about you people. And he's like, "Oh, I'm not a turkey." And then, like, they have a conversation for a little bit. He's like, "Well, I'm I'm racist, so <laughs> <laughs> so funny." <laughs> oh man, I that love is that. Pretty that is that really is pretty funny. good. And uh, uh, last, the uh, the turkey using a wishbone to explode, I thought was good. Yeah. I thought that was really good. 
it's that's the thing is like Rick and Morty, even in the episodes I don't love, there's always going to be something that is just like, that's fun and clever. Like, that's really mm-hmm. smart and clever. You know, like there it's just a show that even even in the episodes that I don't like and don't necessarily want to rewatch, uh, I, I can almost always find something that I appreciate about it, which I think mm-hmm. is very impressive. <laughs> it's a very impressive thing. Yeah. Um, got any more for the thing? Exploitation spectacular. Or should we move on? Nah, man. All right, let's do it. This is like the this this these three are the stretch that I'm like kind of lukewarm on. But this is Go- Gotron, Jerrysis, Rick Van Gel- Rick Vangelian, Gotron, oh, Jerrysis, Rick Vangelian. Why did they uh, throw Jerry in there? Because it because it's because ge- it's Genesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Genesis, whatever. Um. So this is uh this is the Voltron episode. They just do a Voltron episode. But also weirdly, it's like a mafia movie parody with all the voiceovers and the family so, stuff. Yeah, it is it is a mafia movie parody, but there's also a lot of uh there's a lot of Wolf of Wall Street in there too. Right. I wrote that. Right. I wrote that too. That there's some Wolf of Wall Street in there, right? Or maybe it's just a Scorsese thing, because <laughs> like, he does mafia mm, movies too. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Maybe it's uh, it's so it's it's so interesting because that is like I do like some of the the specifics they bring in with the like with that like with this becoming a sort of mafia type family who's you know granting. Who's, who's granting favors to the other families, the other, the other, you know, Smith families and the other Ricks and all that stuff. Like they have all this power uh, because mm-hmm. they have the fifth Gotron ferret <laughs> because they are, because they have the full volt, full Gotron robot. They have this ability. And then also the like subversion where summer is sort of the one who's become the favorite the favorite child for for rick who's now controlling it and you've got this issue between morty and summer that's pretty interesting um it it felt a bit like obviously this is dan Harmon doing the show and and i don't know if you've watched community but season one has like of community has one of my favorite episodes of television ever uh it's and it's an episode it's called Amer- it's con- called contemporary american poultry and the whole episode is about how much everyone at their community college loves the chicken fingers that they put out at the cafeteria uh, so much that they, they realize that one of the characters is working in the kitchen so that he can skim chicken fingers off the top and give them to people uh, and then get <laughs> favors for that. And so basically they see that and the like group in, in the community episode, they uh, get him fired, have one of their people, jump in to take over that role and then they become the new top dog and it's a full-on mafia parody but it's they're controlling they're controlling everyone through the chicken fingers and their access to the chicken fingers so they're like oh we're gonna get you like like what they basically have people come to them and be like i can offer you this if you can get me five chicken fingers every wednesday or whatever (laughs) and so it it becomes this whole mafia family thing and it's so funny and well executed and i can't help because these are both Harmon shows like look at this episode and look at that episode and be like mm, he did it better 10 years ago <laughs> he did it a little better yes yeah. um you know obviously they do it very differently uh and the third act of this is wild because this is the incest baby follow-up <laughs> which gets, it, it absolutely is <laughs> it, it gets crazy with that um which frankly i'm like glad they followed that up because that is just like a giant crazy thing that they dropped in an episode this season Mm -hmm. and to just ignore that forever feels like what they would do with rick and morty but instead yeah instead they're like oh we're bringing back the incest baby yeah absolutely (laughs) oh man Um, but yeah this was uh this was one of the ones that i skipped i didn't i didn't know this happened uh which is kind of dumb on my part because it's in the intro uh, that's right so this absolutely did happen and i guess i just missed it um i did kind of feel like this is another one where i really really like the concept but at a certain point it did start to drag for me a little bit yeah um because i was I, I liked it and i was there for the ride i was with all the, the mafia shit like i was with it but then it just kind of kept going for a little while a little bit too too longer than um I was uh, anticipating, I guess. Um, 
So that kind of uh, dragged it down um, a little bit for me. This one, this one has a Jerry line that I really like. Uh, when he's really excited that they're in like the robots, and then he says, "I can't believe I almost went to the chiropractor." <laughs> <laughs> I just think that that's really funny <laughs> that he skipped yeah. his uh, chiropractor appointment <laughs> to be in a Voltron robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I do like, and I do also kind of like that Summer is kind of front and center in this one. Like, I feel like she isn't that much in the season. It kind of felt like it kind of felt like she was going to be. Well, no, I guess she was, she's been in a, a fair amount, but they've like it felt like they were increasing Summer's presence in season three and four. And this one maybe was a little step backwards, um, mm. although there are a couple that are like pretty summer heavy, like this one's summer heavy. And then Rick Dependent Spray's got a lot of summer stuff. Uh, we didn't nice. even talk about in Mort Dinner, Rick Andre. She's got the whole subplot. We don't see it happening, but she's like supposed to go to the bottom of Mariana's trench to get Mr. Nimbus's like magic shell, oh, which, yeah. which is funny. Yeah. It's a funny idea, I think. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's I, I don't know. I almost feel like this episode has too much going on, which I guess is a thing you can say about a lot of Rick and Morty episodes. They tend to take an idea and just like <laughs> blow it up, balloon it up as much as they can. Right. Um and uh, this one, it's like, oh, OK, so it's a Voltron parody and it's a mafia movie. Oh, and the third act is going to be a direct follow up to our incest baby story. Right. <laughs> it's a lot going on. Uh, and I don't know. I don't dislike it. Um, Likewise. Yeah, it does some things that I really I really like all the voiceover stuff, especially the, the cold open. Like, I love that. Yeah. I love that gag. Yeah, me too. With, like Morty's like, hello. And like they like, keep walking and shit. Yep. He's like, yeah, I love that. And they um, also at the end do the funny thing is what are they called? Um, voice ovarians. Like they're, yeah, they're, yeah, yeah, I love they're, the payoff. The it's a good yeah, payoff. That's, that's really funny. It's a good uh, payoff. And that's very Rick and Morty. I like I like when they they explain away a television trope with some sci fi bullshit. <laughs> that's mm. fun. It reminds me of um, the Parasites episode that they did all the flashback clip show stuff. Uh What's that one? Total Recall. Classic. Yeah. One of the best steps of the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, decent episode. Solid. Solid. Not bad. <laughs> right. Uh, all right. Let's move on to 508. And we're getting into the final stretch of the show that I yes, think is really good. Like this, these, these last three episodes to me are all really strong. Good. Yeah. Um, and here we go with this title. <laughs> Rick Turnal friend shine of the spotless Mort. <laughs> um, I think not only is this a great executed episode, but a great conceptual episode uh, because a, it's a Rick episode. We don't really have, we don't really get Morty or the family in it, which is awesome. I think, I think when they mm -hmm. uh, just really deep dive into Rick, we, we get some cool stuff. And so uh, I think it's a cool, trippy, clever way to explore rick's backstory um and be able to explore a breadth of his backstory without right. um without like you know having to go too into detail about every single thing we get to see so many aspects of his life in this in this episode mm -hmm. um and it's cool it's just like going into what well, it's basically he's going into bird person's memory and so he's exploring all of the shared memories that bird person has of rick so we get to see these little slices of his life uh that were important to him um yeah what do you think you like this one yeah no nah, I, li I like this one a lot um when i first the first time i saw it i loved it uh this time it was it wasn't as fun as it was the first time but i feel like i might have to attribute that with just like i've talked about this before but rick and morty is probably the hardest show to binge mm -hmm. so <laughs> I think I don't want to blame the episode for not being fun this time around. I think I'm going to blame the fact that I watched so many of these. Yeah, uh, I feel in you. A row. <laughs> I kind of felt but, the same way on this rewatch. I was like, it was, yeah, it mm -hmm. was after watching all of them. I was like, oh, it's a lot. But um, I remember how I felt the first time I saw this. And it was, yeah. I was like, yeah, I, I really like this. this is, like I said, this is the one I paid for uh, after I missed it. And I can't remember why. I don't remember if Kevin told me that bird person was in it. I don't remember why, but I was like, yeah, let me let me go see. What this we were is. probably talking about it in Discord about how much we liked it. And you were probably like, oh, probably. shit, I got to watch this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, 
but I liked it. I, I, I like I, I like this one a lot. It's cool, and they drop a lot of like important contextual ideas for Rick's backstory, and also like some major drops. Like we we basically get confirmation in this that that uh, at least Beth that at least our Rick's Beth is dead. Um, yeah, our dead daughter. Yes, exactly. Because he meet because basically Rick meets a bird person memory of a younger version of himself who then goes in to help him through all of these, through all of these, this memory exploration. Uh, and, and he's getting sort of judged by his younger self. Um, but yeah, that's like, it's an interesting piece of lore drop, which obviously they explore more in the, in the fall, in the finale of the season. Um, mm-hmm. But that's like good stuff. And also I just like, I like them exploring his relationship with bird person because this is like, I think, these kinds of stories give some much needed grounded humanity to Rick, uh, who too often feels just like a super science God. And like, he's not really dis- not really connected to any people, you know? Um, yeah. But this one, like he literally, literally says that he loves bird person in this, you know, mm-hmm. um, which is not something I would expect from the show. And I'm sure also spawned a whole legion of Rick expert person shippers. Uh, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> honestly like a lot of that a lot of the the end of the episode i was kind of like oh man is this like this could easily move into a romantic territory if they wanted it to <laughs> they could have like rick could, could definitely have a major crush on bird person uh which would also explain why he was so could also explain why he was so upset at bird person's wedding back in season two at the wedding yeah, mm, yeah. <laughs> so, should have been me yeah <laughs> sorry that i'm throwing that out into the world but if any of you want to latch on to that uh, that that theory uh do it <laughs> do it <laughs> i want to cause oh, chaos crumb. yeah there it is <laughs> um, it. who cares but yeah this episode rules it's really cool it's a really smart mm-hmm. way to explore rick's backstory and uh and also just like visually really neat and and we see a lot of cool yeah yeah, get some cool stuff like the ways that the memories start to to collapse in on themselves it's very inceptiony uh but it's it's neat it it like it was cool to watch them have to escape and flee their memories into other memories i like that ending right Um, and then also there's some lore drop in this that like is definitely easily stuff they could and might follow up like um bird person and tammy have a have a kid who's in a jail somewhere yeah yeah and each the yeah, bird person just goes yeah and so, yeah uh, yeah we go find this kid. and then and then in the in the tag we we meet we meet them and we learn that they're like a super violent <laughs> super violent right. criminal yeah thing. that yeah. is this tag yeah and yeah, that's that. uh that's interesting i hope that's something we see explored like they they, they do a, a cool job in this season planting little seeds like that nothing that i'm like mm-hmm. oh this is something we need to follow up but stuff that i'm like oh this is stuff they could follow up and i feel like we'll probably see that stuff come come up again at some point um right. yeah this is uh this is the second episode this season where rick's takes not rick's technology wants to have sex because <laughs> it happens it happens with the ship the ship tries the uh like fuck like bumblebee or something right and then uh in this one uh the the, the garage just literally tells bro like yo i'll, I'll top you off if you go get me all this shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> i like when he's when she's trying to lure the guy into the into the garage and she's like do you like marvel movies, marvel like, movies? Yeah, yeah of course who doesn't <laughs> That's so, yeah, it's funny. so funny. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> oh man. Um yeah, cool episode. Good episode. I I I don't know. I don't have I don't have a whole lot else to say about it. I just think it's like a really great yeah, well executed episode and it's and and I always I also am just impressed that they did such a good thorough engaging episode with really out like the the this the tiny B story was the like was like the AI in the garage basically. Um, yeah. And, yeah. That, and, and other than that though, it was like an all Rick episode basically. So mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's good. It's a good one. Big fan, big fan. Yeah. I think the stuff in the garage was just designed for them to, um, to have something to cut to honestly. Uh, agreed. Like, agreed. Yeah. Uh, and it is funny, you know, it's just, it like, is funny yeah. though. I'm not complaining. The stuff is funny. So, um, all right. Should we move on yeah, to 509? You got anything else? Nah, it's hit 509. All right, 509. Forgetting Sarah Rick 
Mort Scholl. Whatever. <sighs> Damn, I don't know. Whatever, man. I, don't I, know. I groan when I say them, but I'm also like, yeah, make them more convoluted. Make them stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <laughs> my first note is just this episode's kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot to unpack. I, I think there's a lot to unpack in this episode, and it's really interesting. Um, but I really like this one. I, I like the beginning. The cold open is kind of just this reveal that Morty feels the need to go back through all of these dimensions in which they they have caused chaos through adventures with Rick and, and fix things. Um, he feels this like mm-hmm. regret and shame and like re- re- and uh, over the things over the negative ways they've affected all of these places they've visited. And you see him going through all these other ones and just like fixing right. and fixing everything, which I think is um, a cool character moment for Morty. And also just like another further establishing how far he has come as a character um, in terms of his capability and his confidence. Uh, and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, and obviously the more he learns, the more defiant he is of Rick, the more he wants to do his own shit, um, outside of his adventures with Rick. And I think that's just like a really, I like, I love everything about that cold open. I think it's really interesting. Um, yeah. Which leads into the premise of the episode, which is Rick getting so fed up with Morty that he replaces him with two crows. (laughs) Right. Which I really like the two crows i love I the two crows rick's really, i think rick's relationship with them is really enduring <laughs> i love the two crows that's so silly to I say do, yeah. that i love yeah. the two crows but i also like you know he lure he he like he like lure not necessarily lures them but that is a real thing with crows is if you like feed them enough you can like earn their friendship and so he like earns their friendship and then he starts adventuring with them uh, and it's I, I think Rick's adventure with the crows is like funny. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> um, and it's also like they came up with some really fun, creative ways for him to like do cool shit with just two crows. <laughs> it's pretty mm-hmm. wild. Uh, but I think Morty's journey in this episode is even crazier um, where he yeah. he gets he he basically gets the portal juice on his hand and he has a permanent portal on his hand that leads directly to this other dude who seems to imply he's had a prior relationship with Rick uh, and he's got a little portal on his leg. And so they're permanently connected through this portal that's attached to them, which is also just a crazy, crazy idea. That's like it's pretty wild. And then the, also, again, in the same in the same vein of like how the way they found incredibly creative ways for Rick to do cool action sequences with crows, they found incredibly mm-hmm. creative ways for Morty to do action sequences with these yeah, portals. Yeah, that uh, the fight scene in the asylum is yeah. crazy creative. Like, it's it, it really, really cool. Is. It is really creative. Yeah, agreed. Completely agreed. Uh, and and yeah, it's like Morty feeling the need to go out and and it's kind of building everything that they've been building up with his own independence and capability. He's like, oh, I can go. Do, we can go do shit without Rick. We don't need Rick. And then he kind of puts his trust mm-hmm. in this stranger only to find that this guy is using him and not really he does. He's not really doing it for the same reasons that Morty is. He's he's kind of got his own motivations that are are less uh, that are are a little a little more dangerous i guess like i don't know how to describe it he's uh he's kind of got his own more selfish motivations he's not trying to do the same kind of thing that morty is um which leads to like like all of the stuff where they're fighting and how he can't he just can't escape this other guy because they're literally connected through a portal um is really interesting Mm -hmm. it's really crazy stuff and the whole final the whole final fight um with the train is crazy yeah <laughs> it's crazy yeah it is uh morty basically basically get let allows his own hand to be cut off mm-hmm. by the by the train by getting run over by a train so that he can so that he can sever his connection with this dude yeah it uh, makes me sick thinking about it <laughs> you know what I, I, even though like within the rick and morty universe it makes a million and a half percent that he just immediately grows a new hand i i was kind of hoping it hoping our morty would get like a robot hand or something you know what i mean like i want uh, like I, want, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was kind of hoping our morty would have a this is such a big thing for him to go through it's such a huge huge like 
like I, I feel like it was a huge journey for him to go through like this. And I kind of wish he had had a permanent physical like re- like a per- permanent physical addition because of this journey that he went on. Um, right. Even though like, you know, it's Rick and Morty. It makes sense. He can grow a hand real easy, but <laughs> it's uh, I don't know. I think that would have been interesting to do. But no, nah, I guess. You. Yeah. Um, I thought I fully thought I was a little surprised going into these because they if you guys don't know, they aired these last two as a as a one. They called it a one hour finale and the episodes do tie together, uh, but they Absolutely. they don't feel like they don't feel like the first half and the second half to me. They feel like two separate episodes that tie together, you know, at the end of one and the beginning of the other. They do, It doesn't really. Mm-hmm. Nec- uh, but I do like. Um, I, I was kind of fully expecting just with the way the episode went down. I was like, oh, OK, so the end is kind of going to be, you know, Morty. Morty is like, oh, I regret I regret like not, you know, taking you for granted, Rick. I think we I think we need to work together still. And I, I expected Rick to be like, yes, agreed. But Rick then reevaluates his codependency with Morty, mm-hmm. um, which is great. A great which ending. I, I thought it was. I thought it was really interesting. I love that the the crow stuff, even Rick even says it, but I love that the crow stuff starts out as a bit, but it legitimately leads to legitimate character growth, which was an issue that we had in yes. like some of the some of the other years. It was just exactly. kind of like he does, he isn't he isn't learning anything, he doesn't care about anything. Like how at a certain point we gotta step back and realize that there is no way for this character to be sympathetic if he doesn't have any kind of any kind of emotion, any kind of regret. You know what I mean? At least not some that is shown. Right. Uh, yep. But here it it I remember the first time I saw it, it, it like blew my mind. The fact that like they let it stay with them. They le- they legitimately let it stick with them. And it doesn't. And I love that. We'll get to the second part. But I love that even in the second in the finale. The way they get them back together isn't just him saying never mind Mm -hmm. like he still learned what happened uh he still learned from what happened before and it still continues to stay with him and i thought that was um i thought that was a really interesting uh way for him to go with that yeah i agree and they even like made him learn more through it like i like Mm-hmm. this episode's really good but hey, let's just i guess we can just start talking about, because it was a one-hour finale and they tie together we can just start talking about rick Mariah jack the the se- season finale um but the whole opening the whole thing opens as though now rick is is part of a part of an anime where it's just him and two crows right <laughs> which, which, which is great i love i love the uh i love the uh the little anime opening thing and i love that it like the the tune of the song carries the same motif as the Rick and Morty theme, yeah. which I thought was like a really clever. Uh, I thought that was I, I like that they did that. <laughs> yeah, and I like that they just jump into it like, oh, they've had thousands of adventures because this is an anime. Like he's uh, he's now had thousands mm-hmm. of adventures with these two crows, and they're just continuing yeah, the yeah. anime. Um, but like they do, kind of talk about and establish that like though he did acknowledge and and embrace that like he needed to re-examine his codependent relationship with Morty, which they still do in this episode. He also was sort of going on these crow adventures uh, as a way to avoid truly in, in examining those things, right? Like it feels like he was just mm-hmm. kind of distracting himself from having to ask himself the real hard questions, which just seems like a very Rick thing to do. Um, and it's still, I think it works very well as both Rick uh, starting to acknowledge some things about himself that he needs to, while also being very Rick about it. <laughs> so, right, right, right. yeah. Um, and then you also like, it's interesting though, the way Morty starts to, starts to portray those codependent, that codependent nature. Like it feels like through the last two seasons, Morty's been more and more, trying to be independent and then through his journey in 509 he's like oh no like i took rick for granted i like i this is an important relationship for me and and to almost to an unhealthy degree where now he's just constantly trying to find rick and Mm -hmm. and like and reestablish the rick and morty adventures um 
and that all honestly it all feels like the first act is kind of this stuff and then and yeah. then and then immediately they're like all yeah. right get them back together evil morty let's go to the citadel you know um, right 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 but it all works like it all works and flows really well and it's all really engaging i agree um i agree so let's talk about the evil Morty. Let's talk about the evil Morty of it all. So, so they pretty much immediately go to the Citadel once because, <laughs> because Morty like makes himself older to try and try and sh- to make Rick feel bad about, mm-hmm. uh, about him being gone so long. Um, and yeah, they do immediately jump into the evil Morty stuff. And, you know, I, I made a video a while ago, hypothesizing that maybe they would make the the Morty the evil Morty story a little more challenging than we might be expecting that he wouldn't necessarily be portrayed as evil but they they went the other route he was he's portrayed as pretty evil so I was not right about that um, but um, <laughs> they still subverted I think they still subverted what you might have expected from it because they pretty just much just immediately are like get that out of the way all right Morty has other motivations you all know that let's like get down let's get down to brass tacks um and i do think the i do think that there is something to be said about his motivations i think they're really interesting and especially with what we were talking about kind of back in when we were talking about 501 in the context of this show is any character like is any character truly evil or are they all truly evil right that's i guess that's the question is like our is our mm. is this morty really any worse than our morty or our rick um and while this evil morty does a lot of detestable things in this episode that like obviously i will never defend um he does right. it because of how rick has how the ricks have exploited morty's over so much time yeah exactly yeah um so like it is in in a way i was right they did challenge our our expectations and of of what you know what his motivations might be and why but uh i was i was wrong on specifics but i do think this is at least like a really interesting and challenging um a challenging path to take this story down uh did you like how do you how do you feel about that aspect of the story did you like what they did with it uh yeah so I'll say this. I'll say that I liked what they did with it m- more the second time around. Because the first time, it's not that I didn't, but my issue with this part, uh, my first time around, was that it felt like they packed so much information, uh, especially into the last two acts, to where I I couldn't keep track of everything. Mm. Like it was okay. He's going to explain his, it wasn't even that it was okay. He's going to explain the origins of the Citadel and everything that happens in it. Yeah. And Rick's whole backstory. He's gonna explain, yeah. Then he's going to explain the motivations. Then we get the backstory. And then it was like, yeah, it was, it was so much. And I'm like, okay, I gotta, it, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot for me to, um, try to understand uh on the first watch but this episode is uh probably the only one in this entire season that gets better the second time Mm. because once i had just the littlest inkling of what was to come it made listening to the explanations and seeing everything play out a little bit easier and it made it a little bit more fun too for sure um so i really i really uh I really did um, enjoy uh, where they went with it. Yeah, it has a it has a really great line uh, where even Morty says after even Morty says that uh, dialogue doesn't matter. Says tonight I do that thing I want to do with the curved thing, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I think I think that's a, I think that's a great little yeah, meta joke. That's pretty funny. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it is like there is a whole lot of information. It does feel like they were just like, okay, you guys want serialization? Here's all of it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do think they did a pretty effective job going through Rick's backstory in a, a pretty, like, efficient way. Uh, obviously, they had to, but I feel... I f- 
and I think you're right. Like on rewatch, because I, I rewatched that sequence a couple times when I started making my video about it just to like make sure mm-hmm. I was grasping what was happening. Um, and it's uh, and it's really interesting. So I guess like I guess the idea here is that our Rick's Beth and Diane are killed by another Rick. The, what we saw in the season three premiere, which there were little details that were different, but basically in that episode, Rick said it was fabricated. We learn isn't entirely fabricated. Um, and he, we learned that, that Diane and Beth were killed when Beth was very young. And mm. then uh, our Rick basically goes on like uh, a revenge driven uh, a, he's completely driven by revenge to find the Rick responsible and kill him, mm-hmm. um, which he still hasn't done. We've learned we that's so that's potentially an ongoing thread that they can they can follow up. But we see that he literally was going through killing all these different Ricks um, and and like killing so many different Ricks to the point where the Ricks were finally just like, OK, we submit like <laughs> let we'll help you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I was still trying to wrap my head around exactly. Um, I was still trying to wrap my head around exactly why they formed the Citadel. And I think is it is is maybe it that once <laughs> once the Rick just our Rick just started killing all of these other Ricks, they finally were like, OK, we'll help you. We'll help you find the Rick you you need to find. I think that's what that shot is. I think that's what that shot where like they're at the table and like it's like a really brief shot, but it's like right. our Rick is at the table and then like the other Ricks are there and he Which, goes, like he's like explaining something to him. Right. I think that's what that shot is. And I think like I talked about this in my video about how the possibilities now because the big the big change at the end of the episode is we learn that what we learn we finally learn what the central finite curve is, which is that Rick has basically isolated a a section of the multiverse in which the Ricks are sort of the top dog and the most dominant force in the universe and, and blocked it off from reaching um, other, the other parts of the infinite multiverse. And so, and so while I hypothesized the possibilities about, you know, what could be out there now that we can potentially reach these other parts of the multiverse, it feels like the idea is that, he was locking in this Rick that he's searching for. They were, he was like, ice, it seems like they were isolating it so that they can more, e- he can maybe potentially more easily find the Rick who has done this to Diane and Ben. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know yeah. if that's for sure. I mean, it's like all stuff you have to kind of surmise from context, mm-hmm. but, but if, if the, the Citadel of Ricks is like, okay, we submit, we'll help you find him that could have been a means to continue to do that, right? Is isolating the curve, um, which I don't know. Maybe we'll find out more about that. Maybe that's way off base, but right. um, but it's, you know, at least interesting to think about. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this. So the end of the episode, What's up? Um, the end of the episode shows uh, Evil Morty basically punch a hole through the curve and get on to the other side of the, the multiverse so that he can access the rest of it. And then he opens up yeah. a gold portal. Uh, he, he, he pulls up the, the hologram of the curve and you see the curve, all of it popping. Now Pop, yeah. I watched the first time I watched it, I was like, Oh, now they're connected. Now the, the two, mo- like the curve is gone. They're both connected again. The second time I watched it, I was like, or did he just punch his way through to the other side? I think that's what it was. I think he just punched his way through to the other side. That's what I think, too. I could see it still being that maybe there is maybe I think there's a couple ways they could do it. It could be that the wall has been torn down and that the multiverse is now fully connected again. Um, It could be that he punched his way through to the other side and and he's the only one who made it over. It could also be that they're not fully connected, but now there's that hole created so that they could get through. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, okay. um, So I think there's a few ways they could do it, but to me, it feels like um, it wouldn't behoove evil Morty to escape the central finite curve. If he's just connecting them permanently 
so that it's easy for Rick to find him again, right? Like he's trying to That's escape. True. He's trying to escape all of the Ricks. So it feels to That's me true. like he tried to punch his way through so that he could escape that stuff. Um, but who knows? I mean, it feels like they could really do anything with it. It's pretty interesting. So you are on the same page as me, though. You think that they? Yeah, I yeah, I definitely I agree. I, but I will say that scene is the highlight of the entire season for me. When he that, when he punches through. Fam, the fucking they take the even Woody theme and they like elevate it. It's, yeah, it's nuts. It's, it's so sick. good. <laughs> it's so sick. Yeah. Uh, I love it. I love it both. I and as like an emotional climactic beat and uh, visually so cool. I love. I love yeah. the the visual of him punching through that hole and then the way that you see sort of like this the way they visualize the multiverse changing uh, in as he moves into the other side of it is really cool. Um, mm. it's really cool. I, I also think, I guess going back to what I was just saying, I, when, when all of the central finite curve bubbles popped, I read that as, oh, he no longer has access to it. That's why, that's why I read it as he got through to the other side. Not at, not that he, not that he tore down the wall more so that, oh, now that he's right. on the other side, he he doesn't have access to the curve anymore. He right? Can't, he can't because that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly how that's exactly how I saw it. Like that, like that. He yeah, he doesn't have a he doesn't have access to that anymore because he's not on like on that side. So, right. For yeah, sure. Well, we're on the same page, but uh, not everyone yeah. is. So comment below if you disagree with us, and uh, especially if you write on Rick and Morty, I want to hear from you. um but i'm eager to see like i mean they've already apparently written season six and are writing season Mm -hmm. seven so like i'm and i'm just like eager to see if um if this is gonna the other thing is like does this um did they basically eliminate most other ricks and mortys like are are we pretty much back to like we got the two yeah yeah, that was kind of a big beat, wasn't it? That like, yeah. even like you see the uh, fucking like carrot top Rick and Morty, they like kill themselves, <laughs> right? And like, but you see actually what happens when they all die is that they just like go into the uh, the 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 thing is yes, yeah, yeah, they get rough. a bunch of them get blended, <laughs> uh huh, um, yeah, and and then a bunch of them get sucked away. Uh, so like, it feels like most of the city, obviously most of the Citadel was destroyed other than that one section of it. Um, Mm -hmm. and I, I guess there were maybe more Mortys with them on that little part. So like, I don't think it's like, they were, I don't think it's all, I don't think like they're the only two left, but it feels like, uh, that's a little bit of a dynamic shift. Like we're, we're maybe going to have this, like maybe the idea that, oh, it could be any Rick and Morty that we're following in any episode could be different now. I don't know. They could, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of directions they could go with it. And I'm eager to see if like, is this going to be a means to like be able to do more with their stories? Like if they open up this other side of the multiverse and they're like, Oh, now we can tell more bigger, like more crazier stories. Or is it more so a means for them to be like, we want to get back to our just Rick and Morty episodes, you know? Yeah. It could be seen either way, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that, I think they do stuff like that on purpose, man. I do too. I do too. <laughs> so they just kind of do whatever they want. Yeah. And they like, it gives them the most flexibility, truthfully. Like it's, right. it's, it, 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 it's a huge seed they planted that they can follow up in a big way, but they not, they are not necessarily required to immediately follow it up which is, uh, mm-hmm. I think, exactly what they want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, good season finale, though. Truthfully, one of my favorite good season season, finale, season right. finales of the whole show. Like, I, I'm i trying to think, I guess the season two finale is right. a really strong contender. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I think this might be my favorite season finale, even though, like, this season I, is a little I, lower. I uh, it's really good. It's just cool. Good mm-hmm. episode. I'm I enjoyed it. Uh, you got any other thoughts on Rick Mariah Jack? Did you? Oh, I guess maybe we should talk about how, what did how did you feel about the ending beat where because it feels like the whole idea at the end is uh, Rick has to embrace Morty as a partner and less of a 
less of a sidekick because they he's like, uh-huh. oh, I need your help to pull the lever to save us from this. You know, I love that. Yeah, I think it works. I think it works well. I love it. I love I love it a lot. Good I, stuff. I, yeah, I think I think I think it works really well. And I'm interested to see uh, where they go with that from here, because I I don't think in, when season six starts by now you kind of know this show right so i don't necessarily think i immediately expect them to pick up where they left off right right however at the very least i would expect them to keep the 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 character changes right so whatever adventure rick and morty go on next i would like to see how this new respect rick has i would like to see how that um uh how that plays into it uh and how how they interact and everything like that like i'm really interested in that i completely agree um we'll see we'll see on yeah. season six of rick and morty probably coming right. uh mid mid to late next year is my guess um sounds about right yeah i'm guessing it'll start in the middle of summer because this one started in june i bet this one i bet the next one starts in like august that would be my guess Mm. um all right uh season five as a whole what do you think i know you said at the top that it's your least favorite season of the show uh yeah. after talking through it do you still feel that way uh after talking through it uh i still feel that way but there are definitely there's there's like one or two more that i realized that i'm like softer on than uh than i took into account for sure i feel yeah but because like yeah i think i started out by saying yeah, there were only like four of these that I would say that I like really like. And I still think that's true. I think this I think the top four in my rank are the ones that like not nah, I really like these. Yeah. But like my like five and six, like I still I had a lot of good things to say about. Totally. Like uh so and like my five, like it's just I just it's, it's weird because like even though it's like ranked smack dab right in the middle it's probably the one that i got the most excited about <laughs> that's <But> funny <laughs> i think yeah i think uh i don't know man i think also just uh it, even in a in taking the season when it was airing um you know it was paired with Tuka and birdie and Hey, two game birdie was just literally doing everything I fucking wanted a cartoon yeah. to do at that time. You know what I mean? Like <sighs> I'm so everything excited. I wanted a cartoon to do. Tuke so so doing. so glad that show is gonna have another season. Even if there's only yeah. one more, like I'm just so glad the show got saved and we're gonna have at least thirty episodes of Two Game Birdie. Uh, hopefully, mm-hmm. we get up to fifty or so. I would like more. Um, Likewise, but yeah, you know, it's I think. Uh, and I think we got to start talking about when we cover that on the pod because that's uh, such a, we both love it so damn much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I fucking love uh, Tuke and Brady. But, you know, I think I think mixing it with the uh, the calm nature um, of those. Those uh, those Tuka episodes and just like the, the all the stuff they were tackling and like how they always took the emotion very seriously like oh pretty much all the stuff that like i i borderline be begging this show to do yeah i think it might it might have uh it might have did something to my viewing at the at the time and in, in taking these like as they were airing but looking at them solo like as their own unit or whatever like i don't that's the thing where i think i started out by saying this but like i don't think any of these episodes are like bad tv or anything like that. right uh just necessarily for me um this is, I think this is the best way to say it. This is the batch of Rick and Morty episodes that I would go back to the least. Like, if I think I would, I were yeah. to, if I were to get up and say, I kind of feel like watching Rick and Morty. I don't know if I would go here. Like, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, don't I feel I similarly about season four. Like, season four has a few standout episodes, okay, and I'm yeah. like, I really like those, and. And so does this one. I think I would, there's a few episodes in the season. I'd be like, oh, I want to rewatch that. I want to rewatch that. Um, and I feel the same way about season four. But I agree. I wouldn't just be like, oh, throw on season five. Let's let's cruise through it. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I did. I did initially think this was my least favorite. Like I said it in the video I put out uh, that it's my least favorite season of the show. But the more I reflect right. on it, the more I'm like, you know, I do think 
I do think I liked these good episodes in this season. I think it elevate, elevated it a tad above season four for me, even though season four has like, obviously the vat of acid episodes really good. Um, season four has a lot of good stuff, but uh, man, Rick convenient Mort is just, I, that's one of my faves. <laughs> it's one of my faves of the whole <laughs> damn run. So um, yeah, I guess with that, we should probably do our rankings and uh, I guess kind of, I kind of just spoiled what my number one is, but we'll go. Um, <laughs> uh Number 10, Rick and Morty's Thanksploitation Spectacular. Number 9, A Mortykin Graffiti. Number 8, Morty Plicity. Number 7, Gotron Jerrysis Rick Vangelion. 6, Rick Dependent Spray. 5, Mort Dinner Rick Andre. 4, Rick Turnal Friendshine of the Spotless Mort. 3, Forgetting Sarek Mortschel. 2, Rick Mirai Jack. And 1, A Rick Convenient Mort. We line up a little bit. I, have a, uh, I, I, f- I feel like we, prob- we probably have the same top four, but different order is my guess. Yes. Mm, thought so. Absolutely. Thought so. Uh, all right. So 10, uh, Amorican Graffiti. How the fuck graffiti. I hate this cartoon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, nine, uh, Morty Plicity. Eight, uh, Mort Dinner, Rick Andre. Uh, seven, <sighs> Goron, Gertron, Gertron, Jerris, Jerrysis, Rick Von. Fuck, I hate this cartoon. Rick Von Gillian. Uh, six, Rick and Morty's uh, Thanksploitation Spectacular. Five, uh, Rick Dependent Spray. Four, uh, Rick Returnal Friendshine of the spotless mort oh man we have to do season six <laughs> three <laughs> three forgetting sir rick mortal marshall uh two rick convenient mort and one rick Mirajak. we were so close to having the same we top four really close. so close and you know what's crazy is that like i om- we almost literally had the exact same top four the reason i put the finale uh, over the uh, Captain Planet one was just because of um, I think the bigness in the finale is what did it for me. It's got like, a lot of scale for sure. Yeah, I think that's what it, I think the scale is what did it for me. Um, but I can't deny that like maybe if you call me on a different day, that order might be switched because the emotion in the Planetina one is insane that's i feel the same way like i think as far as a like what i am generally looking for out of rick and morty rick mirai jack represents that more but i can't Uh like but to me the the like the raw emotion that rick convenient mort made me feel was so overpowering that i'm like oh that's just number one (laughs) like that just has to be totally yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. um cool good list man i'm glad we're we're pretty i mean we're pretty on the same page about this season it feels like (laughs) yeah yeah um and honestly i'd like really i like you know i had i had a lot of thoughts about this season but i really enjoyed talking through it with you that was like i feel like with rick and morty i get so much out of dissecting it with you when we do these episodes that's true yeah because i never realized how much of the uh how much of the show takes a little deciphering to try to figure out right uh what makes these characters tick and you know that kind of stuff um, so now I kind of sound like one of those, uh, you gotta be this level of intelligence dickheads, but like <laughs> they, they do, they do do a lot of interesting stuff and they play with a lot of things. It's really meta. Um, they leave details in there for you to find, uh, stuff that's open-ended, you know, stuff that's like that warrants discussion. You know what I mean? So totally. Um, yeah. and there's like, and you know, for a show that doesn't like to, really fully embrace the serialization all the time there is always so much to speculate about and talk about in terms of what they can and might do uh to follow up serialized elements which i you know i part of me like so many fans get so angry when these things don't get followed up in a timely manner and to Mm -hmm. me i'm just like man i don't i don't care as long as i'm enjoying the show like i (laughs) i uh i don't need them to give me that every episode or every other episode you know what i mean and like and i i granted i think my expectations were set early on because season one does a degree of like 
a small degree of serialization where it establishes the multiverse, st- establishes, uh, and then establishes the Citadel of Rick situation and drops the evil Morty thing. And, and the fact that season two never followed up evil Morty when I expected it to set, set my expectations. You know what I mean? Like just the first two seasons set my expectations. I'm like, Oh, they're not always going to follow up these serialized stories. They're like, they're going to, they're going to take their time and do it in their own time, which is why, like when there was a huge growth in the fan base between seasons two and three, and then season two dropped that great evil Morty episode and people were furious that they didn't follow it up by the finale of season three. I was just like, y'all, are you new here? You must be because <laughs> like they're, they, I knew they weren't going to follow that up in the same season. I knew for a fact, mm-hmm. uh, which is one of the reasons that I made that evil Morty video before season five. Cause I was like, I would put plenty of money that they're going to follow it up this season. Like they take their time, but they're, you know, every two seasons seems to be the pattern and sure enough they did. So, um, Part of me is just like, y'all, you can obviously voice what you want out of the show, but I think you're going to be happier if you just acknowledge the fact that the show is going to be 85% episodic and 15% serialized. And it's yeah. uh, and that's what it is. That's just what this is. <laughs> by, uh, by this point, they're audibly telling you that that is what they want to do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And they've done it a few different ways. So um yeah but uh you know even though it's low on my list i i like i like a lot of this i like a lot about this season of rick and morty i had i had a fun time watching a lot of it i had a really fun time talking about it with you and yeah you uh you got anything else what should we you, should we you got anything else to talk about before we wrap things up uh i mean i don't know i think we get i think we get the people a good a good little rick and morty analysis Give him a good little season five. Yeah, you know no I mean? doubt. Yeah, I think we did a good job. I was a little, I was a little apprehensive because I was like, oh, I don't got a lot of notes, uh, <laughs> and I don't like a lot of these. But <laughs> I think it went pretty well. I think so too. Um, I guess, I guess the other thing we have to talk about, I guess we should just plug the Patreon again. We're gonna have a Patreon very soon. Um, yes, I don't, seriously? I don't. By the time you're listening to us, it might be launched. We're not sure. We still got stuff that we're figuring out for it. Um, Mm -hmm. Stuff we got to film and stuff. Yeah, exactly. But the plan for the Patreon, if you're, and we've got some new plans that we'll just announce right now. Uh, The plan for the Patreon is uh, obviously we're, we're releasing these podcast episodes now in halves. So we cover one season every two seasons every month. And when they release on audio platforms, You got part one and part two. It's just two halves of our season discussion. Uh, The new thing you're going to learn that is if you sign up for our Patreon, uh, you can watch the video version that you find on YouTube one week early. That's going to be a Mm. thing we do. So uh, because we record this all at once and then we split the audio version in half and we launch and we release the video version on YouTube uh, the second week. Uh, But if you join our Patreon, you can get the whole thing one week early, which means you'll still have to wait two weeks for the next full season discussion, but you can listen to it before everyone else. And then in those middle weeks, when you get uh, between us dropping the full video versions, we're also going to release uh, bonus episodes where we talk about movies, which are gonna be a lot easier for us to make because watching a movie is a lot Mm -hmm. easier than watching a full season of TV. We said we were gonna start with Paddington, but we actually are going to start with shrek (laughs) that is the plan uh we're gonna save paddington and when we talk paddington oh we're talking paddington because uh here at cartoons that curse we're big paddington fans and we are probably the most excited people on the earth for p3 so absolutely uh i think get a p3 tattoo (laughs) (laughs) everyone just tweet about p3 everyone talk about p3 we're all everyone's excited for p3 i think i don't think anyone can stop talking about it in the in the paddington saga the the paddington saga saga. (laughs) (laughs) um so that's gonna be what we do uh, you'll probably have you might have heard this twice if you listen to it on the audio platforms because I'm probably going to repeat this information for the outro of the first part. So we'll see. We're still working mm-hmm. out the kinks of how we do it. So if you heard this twice, that's OK. Just means it's just a, an extra reminder to sign up for the Patreon. Um, and I think that's I think that's all we got. You got anything else before we go, Tariq? Uh, 
Nah, man. Uh, be sure to tune in for Shrek. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna get it's gonna get real gross, oh, real yeah. fast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm I'm I don't know if we have to blur that on on YouTube or not. I really have no idea what their liquor Dude, rules are. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You didn't drink it. It's fine. No, nah, um, there's a whole. Did you do you know that there's a whole podcast called Drink Champs? I didn't know that. That's funny. It's a uh, rapper uh, Nori. He uh he gets a whole bunch of his, like he has like guests on like a lot of hip hop people when they just like drink. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, uh, and talk the whole time. I'm very, I'm very excited to drink and talk about movies with you. It's going to be fun, especially because we both have a lot of thoughts about Shrek. Uh, I that's, can't wait. It's going to be really interesting. I think that day is going to uh, be so funny. <laughs> and you know, I'm going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to bring guests onto those too. I also think, uh, I'm hoping that our, our producer Mikey is going to join us for some of those just to, just to be a, a third talking head. I know he's got a lot of thoughts on, on a, I, he's Mikey's a big movie guy and I trust his, uh, I trust his opinions on movies and I like talking to him about it. Oh, look, here he is. I'm here's here. our, here's our yeah. guy. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got thoughts on Shrek. <laughs> I think don't, I don't, don't get me started, dude. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't, don't open the floodgates just yet. <laughs> oh man, um, I don't. I hope we don't. I hope we don't. Uh, you know, but the thing is, fa- people are fans of Shrek, so it's gonna feel if, if Mikey and I both are both a little little dis uh, d- dislike on Shrek. I'm wondering if it's gonna feel like we're teaming up on Shrek. I can't wait, man. Can, I don't know. I'm gonna try to hold it down. He can take it. He's got I'm layers. Gonna, I'm gonna do my best. You know what I'm gonna do? Uh, do we have? T- <laughs> do we? Uh, I'm trying. I wonder if we have enough time to where I can get Shrek ears sent to my house, dude. Do so it. So I can wear them during the. I'm gonna, you gotta I'm, order them right now. Finish recording. <laughs> yeah, after we finish recording, I'm gonna look. <laughs> <laughs> they might get here, son. I'm gonna uh, check when we get off. That's so funny. I have the Blu-rays. Obviously, are they streaming anywhere for people to follow along if they wanna? If they wanna, I, listen I'm to pretty uh, sure I it's know on Hulu. the. I know the first two are one thousand percent. You know what I think? I don't know about the. I think they have terrible one, artwork. Yes, they do. They I do. hate. I hate those. It's thumbnails. just like the green you know what background. I think, I think Shrek one, two, and four. Are on are on Hulu, but not three. They just ignored three. <laughs> not the three best sucks, one, man. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it would be funny if that was my one. take from watching the Shrek movie. Yeah, it's like Shrek three is actually <sighs> the good one. Everyone else That's is the bad. wrong take. <laughs> <laughs> We'll stand uh, for it, man. I'm excited. It's gonna be fun. That's Shrek the Turd, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, uh, I'm excited. I'm really excited to start talking, doing these movie episodes because we. I had so much fun talking about the movies we covered for those two months or whatever. So, yeah, um, yeah. and and I'm also just like these. I mean, we've only done it twice now, but these records are so much more fun. When we don't have to, to, when we don't have to watch a whole season of a show every week, <laughs> it's like we're just Absolutely. we're gonna have more fun doing it this way, um, and and you're gonna get a better product if we enjoy it. So <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm excited. So I guess with that we should uh, say our goodbyes. Uh, I'm gonna thank our producer Michael Yunez, who's here with us for producing and editing the podcast and talking Shrek. We're gonna talk a lot of Shrek. Can't wait. Um, uh, thank you to Carrie Feek for our amazing artwork. Thank you to Jake Neutron for our incredible theme song. Thank you to Nerfic Tariq for co-hosting the podcast with me. Uh, thanks, thanks to me for co-hosting the podcast with Tariq. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, we we love you, and we'll talk to you soon.